We are live, ladies and gentlemen, and this is going to be a heck of a show. So stay tuned. I'm going to go ahead and do our little basic 30 second intro, giving people enough time to get the notification that YouTube is saying you better bring your behind and check this out. This is going to be good. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to do our intro here in just one second. But for those of you who haven't watched part one, it's probably really important that you go and check it out. It's a just over three hour video and it's superb on the first generation Christians. Why the Apostle Paul was a real guy. These aren't epistolary fictions. These are legit letters, at least the seven are. And then, of course, most scholars say the seven after the seven you have forgeries and people writing in the name of Paul and such. So first things first, let's get to the intro before we talk to our scholar. We are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Derek Lambert. We're going to be doing a deep dive into the second generation of Christians, those after the Apostle Paul and the earliest ones that we can imagine in through the writings. As Dr. Steve Mason talked about last time, Paul's letters are like listening to half of a conversation. You get enough to get the gist of things, though, and this is what this is what scholarship does. They, they are looking at this going, what is this guy saying? Who are his opponents? What is the problem? And they delve into this writing, obviously extensive literature pertaining to the subject. Now, before we get started, I want to say thank you, Renee Ford, for the five on the super chat. It says, love you, Derek, but tell your wife that my love isn't in the <laughs> biblical sense of the word. Laugh out loud. So you don't know me. Uh, we have not begotten anyone. I, I totally, totally get it. I think my wife will appreciate that. Thanks so much for the super chat. <laughs> Love you, Renee. <laughs> What's that noise? Do you guys hear something? Is that the ghost of the uh, second century Christians? No, it's Dr. Steve Mason, ladies and gentlemen. How hey. are you doing, Dr. Steve? Hey, I'm very well. Thanks for inviting me back, Derek. It's great to be here. I love that in that new introduction, man. That's fantastic. Uh, well, the, yeah. gra the graphics are superb. Hey, my yeah. my good friend Jonathan Sheffield, bro. He uh he can make all sorts of wonderful cartoony intros. He's a wonderful Christian guy too. So I am friends with Christians, atheists, agnostic. It doesn't matter. People who who are Eastern religion support. You know, whatever your position is. Um, if you're a human, I care. You know, but too often they're splitting hairs over what you think and what I think cause us to not like each other. And um, I am not a fond of, I'm not fond of bullies, but I will say, um, you know, as long as you're a decent person, I, I totally respect that. We also have another super chat before we get peeked in here to this intro, letting people flow in. Stuart C., thank you for the super, my friend. I appreciate it. Thanks, Dr. Mason, for sharing your amazing <laughs> insights and knowledge with us plebs. <laughs> and thanks, Derek. <laughs> and thanks, Derek, for making this happen. Stuart, thank you, man. I can't wait to see what Dr. Mason brings to the table because... He is one of the more thorough, um, detailed uh, explainers. Uh, you're, you're a great teacher. I'm not trying to just ask his here and pretend that 
This is a legit thing. You really take your time. You roll over. You, you literally uncover every stone and you pay attention to the details. You don't rule out any possibilities. You know, you're really taking your time. And that's one thing I think we really appreciate, even if it is a three hour video. It doesn't matter. You know what I mean? <laughs> hence, hence the three hours, man. <laughs> I hence, guess. Hence the three hours. So, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, go get his books. I'm going to spare you guys the intro and the bio. I mean, because the first video, I go through his bio. We've done quite a few interviews with Dr. Steve Mason. If you're wanting to know more about him, go down in the description of this video. His books are in, at, in the link down there, Recommended Books by Myth, uh, Myth Vision, Recommended Books. And early Christian readers pretty much going to go into the vein of things we're going to discuss today. 902 for a paperback? That's crazy. Um, hardcovers, thirty nine ninety five. I don't know who <laughs> this must have your signature and DNA in it or something. No, I, you know what it is. There is no paperback, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is. So some somebody has, I guess, meticulously pieced one together. <laughs> Absolutely. Also, ladies and gentlemen, go check out Patreon. You can join for three dollars a month, U.S. dollars a month, and you can access hundreds of videos. This helps Myth Vision grow and keep us going. I do this full time. You guys, this is my job. So I work every day to edit, to promote and make more content, to educate people, not just in the field of biblical studies, science as well. I want to understand the brain. I also want to expose cults that are harmful and their, their horrible policies of disconnection from family members. Dr. Hendall, for example, dating the Hebrew Bible he argues that minimal, like extreme minimalism is wrong, and so is extreme maximalism. There is a medium, a happy medium in the history of, of dating the text. Uh, obviously, the recent interviews with Dr. Staples. There is a three-part to this series that I just launched uh, on the historical Jesus with Dr. Price and Dr. Dennis R. McDonald. Mimesis criticism, things get much better. I know you guys saw the cliffhanger in the first one. And then, of course, they believe that they are the true defenders of the Bible, whereas Christians think they're defending the Bible, the fundamentalists. But honestly, the scholars are they're like, no, you're mishandling the reality of the text. And it's far more beautiful when you see its imperfections, its blemishes, its humanity than it is making it a magical book written by the finger of God in perfect ways. You, you miss so much. So. There's so many things on Patreon. If you haven't joined, please consider doing so. That is what helps us grow. Ladies and gentlemen, with that being said, some super chats have popped in. <laughs> Arjun, thank you so much. No questions for Guru Steve today. Just Sunday tithing to Pastor Derek of Myth Vision Baptist <laughs> Church. Thank you. <laughs> oh God, you're gonna give the uh you're gonna give some hardcore atheist uh some some real uh fire you know some fuel for the fire i knew you were secretly a christian or some crap so thanks a lot man i appreciate the super chat and ben he says just picked up dr mason's josephus in the new testament book looking forward to this show thank you man i appreciate it so dr mason i guess we won't waste any more time did you have anything you want to say before i bring up the uh screen share no just it's not wasting time i enjoy it and uh it's great to see you know, people joining in. And uh, uh, as far as the plebs goes, there's no more uh, plebeian than me. You know, I was the first one in my family to even go to university and just got caught up in it all. Anybody can do that. Uh, I'm as much of a plebs uh, as anybody or yes. plebeian. So, hey, we're all in the same, we're all in the same boat here. Um, just we have different things to do with our lives. So uh, yes, I'm sure. share, sharing with you some of my stuff. You all have stuff in your lives that's uh, fascinating too. So I just it's, my, it's say, a real pleasure to do that. Yeah. If I may, I want to say, I know you're retired now and um, I really, really, really do appreciate the time that you put into this and teaching uh, us and educating uh, us these things. I've learned so much just in the small amount that if you were still in college, I would, like, I would love to be a student <laughs> in your class. And so I've had the opportunity and here I am now. So okay. we have, probably more students that you'll ever reach out <laughs> on the internet than you ever did through any of these colleges. Yeah. You know what I mean? Thanks. Yeah. I'm not done teaching. I uh, have some things lined up for teaching elsewhere for a bit. Uh, so that's good. You know, I have the freedom to do that now, but this is great. This is really exciting because as I said before, the, the great difference here is everybody who is tuned in now wants to be 
here because otherwise they wouldn't be here. Uh, there's absolutely no reason for anybody to be here unless they're really interested. And for me, uh, trying to present something, that makes all the difference in the world. I mean, imagine a group that just wants to be there and share in these ideas. That's a whole different thing from university teaching. You know, where yeah, some, some 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 people want to be there, but you get yeah. like two or three that might be like uh, pet students. I suspect uh, the others are like, all right, so here's my yeah. assignment. I'm going <laughs> yeah. to do, yeah. yeah. What do we need to do for the exam, kind of thing? You know, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mason. Yeah, yeah. Okay, can I full screen this now? Yes, or, sir. Uh, you may. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I should have said, may I full screen this? Thank you. No, uh, you're fine. <laughs> All right. Uh, actually, you gave a nice introduction there, Derek, from uh, recalling last time, so I can go through this very quickly. Uh, last time we looked at the first generation. This time we look at the second generation. Of course, people spend their entire careers studying this stuff. Um, I don't. Actually, I do other things too, but people do. I have lots of friends who work on you know, the synoptics or Paul or Mark. Uh, pretty much, or John, uh, that's the substance of their research. Uh, so what can we do in one session? Well, what I'm trying to do is, is cheat a little bit and use Mark as our entry point, our dagger into the second generation, the way I used Paul or tried to last time. So a quick recap uh, from the first generation. This all depends on earlier things we did, Derek, uh, on historical method, right? Uh, you remember those uh, podcasts? And there I was laying out how I understand what it means to do history. So I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything uh, here. If there is a partisan, you know, you talked about partisans of this and that, you know, advocates of uh, mythicism and, and other kind of things. Uh, if I'm anything, I'm an advocate of history just historical method. Whatever you end up with is fine with me. I have no stake in what you believe. Uh, and it's not for me a matter of belief. So this differs from all belief-based discussions where mm. people are debating conclusions, right? What I want to do is reason together, investigate together. And I've proposed that in historical investigation has two main components, interpreting what has remained and reconstructing, re reconstructing what hasn't. Uh, and what does it mean to reconstruct the past? Well, we have to imagine it, but we have to come up with the scenario that best explains to our satisfaction, of course, not everyone will disagree, best explains the evidence. And some of the principles that come into play there are principle of economy, use the simplest explanation, don't multiply uh, you know, moving parts. So it's possible that extraterrestrials came down in the first century and wrote the New Testament. It's, I wouldn't exclude it. I mean, scientists today are thinking about extraterrestrials, it's possible. But the principle of economy says you don't need that to understand the, what's, what remains, right? So that's the principle of economy. Just use the simplest explanation you can. And the principle of comparison, that is analogy with everyday life. How do we know that people generally act what are the kind of motives, the fears, the uh, anger, the sources that people have? Well, people are people, so we can assume that it was kind of similar even in antiquity. So what I'm presenting here, and I really hope this is clear, is one worked out scenario methodologically or metho methodically developed, that is, you know, from first principles. So what I've been trying to do is walk through what a historical investigation looks like. So last time, the question was, what's going on in the first generation of Christians, right. Christ followers? And that has two sides. First of all, we've got some evidence. And then, as you said, Derek, some of these letters that have been attributed to Paul actually look like gen genuine letters, in which case they are half of a conversation. So first we try to understand what is there, right? How is Paul responding in what we can see, what we can read? And then we turn around and try to reconstruct what's not there. Like, so what's going on? Who's he talking to? What, what must have been said on the other side of the conversation to provoke his responses? And what we came up with was that Paul's got this, what he calls an announcement, the announcement, which is, you know, Christ died, rose, and is returning soon. And he got this from heaven. He didn't get it from any human being. 
But the great thing about his letters is they, they're a dagger into the first generation because they <laughs> allow us to see him in conflict as soon as he goes out doing this thing, Jesus' brothers and students pop up and say, hey, wait a minute, this guy's ripping you off. He's giving you a watered down version of what it means to follow Christ. It's not just about you know, waiting for Christ to return from heaven, everything's hunky-dory. Uh, you know, Jesus was Jewish. Jesus is the Messiah. You've got to understand Jewish law and, and prophets and all of that. You've got to you know, follow Jewish customs. That's one angle of, uh, uh, of complaint. The other one was the challenge came from these uh, wisdom type teachers like Apollos, who said, no, 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 no. It's not about resurrection in the future, waiting for Christ to return. It's all about Christ taught us how to live in this world, right? How to find wisdom in this world and unpack what it means to be you know, a fulfilled human being in this world. And that's where re resurrection takes place inside you. It doesn't take place at some, it's com not coming out of heaven in the future. So Paul already is interacting with these two different kind of groups. And so to remind you, those who had a chance to watch last time, and for those who didn't, uh, this will be new. Uh, this is the kind of grid I was looking at. So we were looking at Paul as a, as a window into the first generation last time. Today, I'd like to use Mark to do the same thing or same sort of thing into the second generation. After that, of course, comes the third generation and the fourth. We're not going to continue all those generations because <laughs> the because the first two are really, you know, obviously the crucial ones. That's where most of the New Testament texts get written, uh, I think. And then, of course, that leaves the issue of what started all this stuff way back at the beginning. So at the end of today's session, I would like to come back to this question. Uh, you know, was there a Jesus? And uh, if so, what was he on about? Okay. Absolutely. So this yeah. This, by the way, just letting everybody know who's tuning in. Um, if you hit the like button, it helps us. It helps you to pay attention um, to you to myth vision, of course, helps us grow. So if you can hit that like button, it's free. If you guys want to super chat any questions, if I can get them in to Dr. Mason during the conversation, I will. If I find your question is something that may not work within the flow of the conversation, we'll save it and I'll make sure that I ask your question at the end of this uh, live. And that way me and Dr. Mason can take our time and, uh, you know, address your topic. So yeah. I just want to say that before Perfect. we actually get deep dive. And I'm really interested in this question. I'm sure this will even make me want to ask more about the Pauline in the first century Christians, just based on you. You're going to, you're going to screw me up. Just so you know, fair <laughs> warning, Dr. Mason, I hope you have time today because, <laughs> because this is so interesting. So welcome everybody. We just now are starting. So thanks a lot. Go ahead. Dr. Mason. All right. So the summary of last time was basically Paul's got this announcement. He goes around. Christ is going to return soon. God's anger will be poured out on the rest of the world. His faithful, those who have trusted him and remained pure will be evacuated to heaven in the clouds. That's basically the announcement. While they wait, believers must maintain a state of purity. But he faces opposition first from outsiders, total outsiders. Everywhere he goes, he gets uh, kicked out of town because they assume that he's an itinerant teacher teaching a lot of nonsense in order to make money. That's why else would you do this stuff? You know, uh, persuade some people, some gullible people, give you some money, you leave town, you promise them they're going to heaven, they never see you again. Everybody, you know, you're happy and they're, and they're uh, distraught because they're not up in the clouds. So the people of Thessalonica, Philippi, <laughs> Corinth, you know, they are pushing this guy on saying, you know, get out of town, man, or beating him up on the way. Uh, so they, he gets that external grief. Internally, he's hearing from Jesus' own brothers, brothers and students who say, come on, man, you didn't even know the guy. Uh, we were we were with him all the time, and he was much more about with the, he worked within the framework of Judean law and custom, and you're not even talking about that at all. So that's not right. Uh, and then so you have these letters like Second Corinthians, Galatians, where Paul's followers are being persuaded by these people that they should then adopt uh, Jewish law in order to be good followers of Christ. 
And then you've got these other ones, especially in 1 Corinthians, we see it, where they no longer believe in resurrection at all because they've come to Apollos' view. We're already kings. We're already full. We're already ruling. We've already got all knowledge. And Paul has to respond and say, well, nice for you. I don't have all that. I'm waiting for Christ to return. So that's the first generation. And now, without further ado, Ooh. we plunge into the second generation. Where's now, the drum roll, drum roll. Yeah, <laughs> drum roll, trumpet, fan fanfare. Uh, <laughs> this is really, you know, I, I don't know. Th this is some of the coolest stuff you can do, I think, on a Sunday afternoon anyway. Um, it's uh, it's really fun. Uh, I, let, I, I hope I hope you see what I mean. Uh, I'm going to use Mark. I'm going to use the Gospel of Mark as a window. But if you look on this chart on the right side, I, I think it's on. Is it on the right side for you? It it's is. The, yeah, Let me okay. put full screen to try and help people see it better. This okay. is obviously overlapping, showing you Mark yeah. in Matthew, and then yeah, yeah all the good yeah. stuff. It's fantastic. So somebody, a guy named Barr, went to all the trouble of mapping out, I mean, in a very scientific way, the exact length of each of the Gospels, the synoptic Gospels, that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, relative to each other. Because this is not obvious, right? When you're reading right. like a one of those onion skin Bibles with the leather cover and you're just going through, you don't really have any sense of this at all, right? It's all just pages. So what he's done is he's taken each, what we, what we call, pardon me using technical language, but some of you will know the term pericope. Looks just like a periscope, but without the S. So, but it said pericope. Uh, and that means it's just a little unit, a little unit of text. So like a, you know, the story, one day Jesus went here, he did this, got into an argument, end of story. Next day he went here, met some Pharisees, like that. That's each one of those is a pericope, okay? So what this guy did was he isolated each pericope in Mark, for example, and colored pink all the stuff that is shared between Mark and either or and or Matthew and Luke. So what do you see there? All the, the green stuff is only in Mark. Now, what you see, obviously, Derek, is there's hardly any green stuff, right? Right. Uh, so the pink is shared by at least Matthew, most of it in Matthew, but a good chunk of it in, in Luke. Now, that's already quite interesting. The blue stuff is shared between Matthew and Luke. White is Matthew alone. Yellow is Luke alone. So this is already very interesting. And then what he did is he stuck the Matthew over again on the right side so you can do direct comparisons with Luke. Now, it's not big enough, obviously, for us to right, do right. detailed comparisons. I'm not expecting you. Don't worry. Don't be thinking that your vision is uh, is going <laughs> if you can't read this. Nobody can read this unless, uh, you know, Superman. Um, that's not my point. My point is just to let you see the overall picture of the, the color scheme because... It's is the purpose of this to show, you know, you know, apologists say, oh, well, they're all eyewitnesses. And, they, and if you took them into the court of law or you try to have like I've heard forensic or uh, people who are in law enforcement, they go to question people. If your story is too much alike, they know for a fact, like the way you word it, the way you actually say it, you guys corroborated prior to actually them investigating you. However, yeah. yeah. You know, based on this type of stuff in this chart, it's evident Mark is used as a source, not as a, oh, they just came up with the same thing at the end of the day because of the Holy Spirit or because of God or whatever. No, there's some science behind showing why they used another book to write their yeah. own book. And yeah. that's the power of this. Actually, we have to be a little bit careful. Okay. Uh, what, what this shows is that Mark is the middle term. That is to say, Mark is... Mark provides the basic sequence that is in the others. It doesn't necessarily mean that Mark is first, but we'll, we'll come to that in a second. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll explain why that's the case. But you're, Derek, you anticipated uh, precisely where I'm going with this. Um, so let's looks, look at some facts. Mark consists of, comprises 662 verses. 
that the verse length is a bit arbitrary, you know, stuck in verses where there was kind of sentences or half sentence, but still it's a useful kind of marker. They're pretty similar in, in all three cases, but that already shows you Matthew is 1,069, Luke is even longer, 1150. So each is, you know, roughly 50% longer than Mark, say. But if you look at the 609 verses of Mark that are in Matthew, they become only 523. So 92% of Mark, that is 609 verses, turns out to be, and you can see this if you compare them, right? That all the pink right. stuff there amounts to about 50% of Matthew. And not only that, but it provides the narrative spine. I think you can't see my cursor uh, on the screen, can you? Um, can you? Wiggle it around, let's see. Yeah, I, I'm wiggling it around. Yeah, I, not, I'm blind you, as a bat, dude. Yeah, <laughs> well, no, but you, you, would, you would see it, because I can see it very clearly. Um, okay. Yeah, so you're not seeing it. That's okay, good for me to know. But what you see is if you look up at the top around Matthew 3 there, if you can see that, there's pink, and then Matthew 4, pink. Matthew 5, pink, and then you got the Sermon on the Mount for three chapters, a bunch of, of, of chit-chat, talking, right? Yes, but sir. then in 8 and 9, all pink again, and then more talk, and then lots of narrative for several chapters that's all pink, and then the passion story, the, the story of Jesus' arrest and crucifixion, all pink at the end, right? So that means that the basic narratives of Matthew and Mark agree with each other. And uh, almost all of Mark is subsumed in Matthew. Whether Mark came first or not, you know, how to explain that, that's another issue, but that's the fact, right? Just counting up, that's one thing. Second, if you compare with Luke, it's not as much. So you can see that Luke has less of the pink, right? Uh, so all of this, a lot of yellow, blue, and then, Notice this, that Mark appears, the pink stuff, is in uh, chunks. So whereas in, in Matthew, Mark is like the narrative spine, agrees with Mark. Right. right. Whereas it's not the case with Luke. With Luke, you have a whole bunch of narrative that is yellow, right? Yellow all the way through at, at beginning, middle, and end. And the pink stuff is in chunks. So that's quite an interesting thing. And it only accounts for uh, under 30% of Luke, but still quite significant, right? So that's, that's a starting point. And that's an overall view. There is agreement in the order of episodes. And that's interesting because if you had independent people, right? And if they're just recalling stories, if you say, you know what? One day I remember this story, Jesus was talking to these people and then another person said, hey, yeah, I rem that reminds me of another story. Okay, then, then you would think that if somebody committed these to writing, they would all be in different arrangements, right? right. Because th they would be independent and they'd arise from different memories. But that's not the case. Uh, when we compare these, the, the reason they're called synoptic is when you compare them, they follow basically the same order of episodes parables, con first parables, then conflicts, even though in the story itself, there's no indication of time. It doesn't say he did this on Tuesday and then on Friday, you know, he went over here. It's just like uh, one, sa one Sabbath, you know, he was doing this. So that means that there is some kind of structure somewhere, uh, narrative structure people are following, and it's not just from memory, okay? Right. Then... Moreover, even more compelling is that when you look inside each of these pericopes, you find that their word choice in Greek and their so that their diction and their sentence structure, not only in the sayings of Jesus, but also in the narrative that the author writes to link up the sayings, it all is not all, but there's a lot of verbal similarity. For example, one of the early stories in Mark, uh, chapter one, is where Jesus, uh, verse 16 or so, Jesus walking along uh, the, the side of the lake in Galilee, and he sees uh, uh, Simon and John casting their nets in the sea 
for they were fishermen. And he said to them, uh, 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 pull in your nets and follow me. And they pulled in their nets and followed him. All right, all of this, if you just look at it in Greek, it's amazing that it just agrees. And the, even the sentence structure, you know, casting their nets in the sea for they were fishermen, that's not something two people would agree on writing, right? Would would you agree with me, Derek? Yeah. Or, I, yeah. I mean, like it, it's impossible. If you heard that in court, like you were saying, if a cop, if a cop interviewed two people and said, what just happened here? You know, is, is there's somebody running away from the store. And the first guy said, ah, as the door opened, I saw two burly men uh, descend the staircase, right? And then he asked, he turns to the next guy, what did you see? Ah, as the door opened, I saw two burly men descend this, you know, the cop's going to say, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't uh, happen. <laughs> yeah. If he said something like, look, there was a guy in the building and he beat someone up. Okay. You've changed it so much. It, it sounds yeah. realistic, but when yeah. you're like, uh, he went down the street to be a, beat a guy named Pete. Yeah, um, yeah, and yeah. it kind of even rhymes sometimes, or it has like a, yeah. it's like, yeah. where did you get this phrase? Or I kicked the, it's hard to kick against the goads. Paul says, yeah. oh, that sounds like Euripides the Bacchae, but, uh, yeah. what do I have? I, I don't know. Anyway. I'm yeah, just yeah. 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 No, no, exactly. Right. There's, there's got, there has to be. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a professor, right. And you see student essays all the time. Anybody who's ever read student essays and marked them will come across the phenomenon where you, you read one. And then, you know, 10 minutes, uh, half an hour later, you read another and say, wait a minute, that, that reminds me of something. And you go back and you read, ah, line by line, even if they changed a few words, they are borrowing from the same source or one is copying the other, right? Or, or they collaborated uh, in some way. There's no way that two people who are independent will come up with the same kind of sustained sentence structure, choice of language. It's not going to happen. So we don't have time now today to go into this in detail. I'm going to jump soon into, into Mark, but this is just a quick background about why, like what is Mark's relationship to the others as a foundation for what I'd like to, to, to explore with you uh, today. Uh, but Mark is really important. So, uh, so the old view, right, the traditional view, which was that there was just Jesus, then right. Matthew was his disciple. That's where he got his information from. Mark got his from Peter. Uh, Luke got his somehow strangely. He was an associate of Paul's, and he got his information somewhere. Uh, that that view is now toast. Uh, <laughs> you, it it's not possible uh, that this is the case. It's just not, you know, by normal historical principles. This does not happen. So we can forget it's burnt toast and we can forget about that. There is some kind of literary dependence. Now, what kind? So very quickly, I'm going to go through the options um, to, to uh, say what, they, what people have tried. Okay, so the, the, one of the oldest called the Griesbach hypothesis, named after a guy strangely called Griesbach, um, coincidentally. Uh, so this was his idea. Matthew was the first one, because this is what the church fathers tended to say. That's why it's at the beginning of the New Testament, uh, that it was the first one, because it seemed somehow very Jewish. So it seemed like closer to the Jewish thing. Right. Uh, and, there, and therefore, if that's the case, maybe you could explain it as Luke got all this. So because what Matthew and Luke have in common is a lot. They have both the blue stuff and the pink stuff. Right. They have all that in common. So if you compare on the right side of the chart, all the pink and all the blue is shared by Matthew and Luke. So this idea was OK. So Luke got it from Matthew. And then Mark came along and said, ah, well, I don't want all those sayings. I'm not interested. I, I like Jesus as a man of action. So I'm just going to get rid of all the sayings. And anyway, they're placed all differently. But what I see is a common thread. So I'm going to I'm going to take out their threat, the common uh, material that is action material, because it follows the same order, and I'm just going to put that in a precy. So Mark would be actually in this view the last of the 
the Gospels, right? That's an ingenious idea. Uh, the problem is that, as we saw last time, I think, uh, with um, or at some point with the fig tree story uh, and other things like that, um, Mark looks rather clumsy and sort of is his grammar is is far less sophisticated. It's much easier to explain Mark as the first than the last of like if you saw Matthew and Luke and then you produced Mark out of it, you would be some kind of a strange bird because they are written in far better style and they have much more exciting stuff like the birth narratives, the virgin birth, the resurrection stories. It's hard to imagine why it's hard to imagine an early Christian writer who would both omit so much stuff right. that is shared and would make it into sort of a little bit sort of uh, clumsy Philistine Greek. Um, so that's, 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 that's the first uh, option. Second one is, okay, and this is, uh, I think you've talked with Mark Goodacre. Uh, he's a you know, very smart fellow and he represents, he advocates this kind of view. Okay, let's say Mark is first, that makes more sense. And it makes more sense that Matthew followed Mark and changed and adapted and improved and added to Mark. Then how do you explain uh, uh, Matthew and Luke? Well, Luke also used Mark for all that pink stuff that's in Luke. And then Luke got all his blue stuff from Matthew directly, right? That, that would seem to make sense. And then each of them, Matthew and Luke added their own stuff. So Matthew white and Luke yellow. So that's a, that is a, you know, it's a respectable hypothesis, but it, ha it creates a couple of problems because it, it's like, so you're, you're saying then that Luke would follow Mark very closely, even verbatim, but when he comes to follow Matthew, first of all, he completely rejects Matthew's birth narrative and resurrection narrative, even though he has them of his own, he totally rejects them and writes completely different birth narrative and resurrection narrative. And he finds all these great sayings in Matthew and he atomizes them. He uh, explodes them and pop, you know, pop, puts them everywhere else. He gets rid of the Sermon on the Mount. He strings them around everywhere else. So many, most scholars like I, like me, have a, have a difficult uh, time imagining this kind of schizophrenia on the part of uh, um, Luke, that he's using Mark verbatim, even though Mark is, a, you know, not such a sophisticated writer. Luke is a sophisticated writer, and yet he's borrowing Matthew while ignoring some really big chunks of Matthew and also that, that seem to be useful for him uh, and also exploding much of what's in Matthew. So most scholars have come up with or favored the other option, which is, uh, many of your viewers will know this one, that Mark uh, uh, contributed to both Matthew and Luke, but these two have no relationship with each other because they're so different, right, from each other. And that necessitates the hypothesis of an extra source that they both used, which is conventionally called Q, a saying source, right? So real quick, th yeah. would you fall into the two document um, source theory? That would be where you fall in, right? Uh, well, I I don't I'm not, I don't have a real I don't really have a dog, and and if sorry for anybody who uh, doesn't like dog racing or horse racing, um, I don't really have an investment in this thing. I think I do think it's clear. I think it's highly probable that Matthew and Luke use Mark. Right. Uh, what else they used? I, I, I think it's very problematic to think that Luke used Matthew or Matthew used Luke um, uh, because of the reasons, for the reasons I just said. Uh, but what Q amounts to, uh, I think that's very tricky. Is it one source? Is it, you know, oral traditions at plus three written texts? Is it, I don't know. Right. I, I, I don't know. But I, but I do think it's highly unlikely that Mark was uh, using Matthew or Luke or that Luke or Matthew used each other. Yeah. Awesome. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. I didn't really get us hung up there. I just figured I'd ask you because, yeah. you know, serious scholars on the far hypothesis as well as the other positions, you know, there's serious people on both ends. And yeah. I, I like to keep my, uh, 
my ears open to all different positions. I'm not a textual critic or a textual scholar in any way. So it's like, you yeah. know, uh, I don't know the language. I can't yeah. really tell you how a phrase looks and how. Yeah, it, yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there are very, very solid scholars uh, for both the, the middle one. You called it the Farrer hypothesis. That's right. The, the middle one there is the Farrer hypothesis. And the other one is variously called the two document or the four document uh, hypothesis, yeah, or uh, other uh, other names. So, um, Mark, now this will explain why uh, I want to use Mark on the hypothesis. So what I've tried to do here is a little exercise in, first of all, interpretation, look at the data we can see that's before us, that's what that chart is all about. And then second, turning to reconstruction. So how do you explain what we can see? And that, that's where we come to these hypotheses, right? These are not given in the texts. These are now, we're imagining the lost world that created what we can see, All right? So already what we've done is a little bit of uh, historical investigation. And let's go then with the hypothesis that Mark at least gave rise to Matthew and Luke. Today, we can forget about Q, more or less, um, for most of what we want to do. Okay? All right, yeah. All right. So what's Mark about? Well, first of all, it's not called Mark, right? As uh, you will know, Derek, and, and many viewers will know, uh, these names were added to the text in the second century and later because of traditions about who wrote them, how they... so. At the beginning of the role, they would add, oh, this is according to Mark, according to Matthew. But actually, the title that the guy himself put on is in the first verse. And how do we know it's a title? Because it's not a sentence. It's not uh, this happened, this person did this. There's no subject and verb. It's just um, a, a, it's a title. <laughs> it's a collection of other words. And that title is The Origin of the Euangelion in right. Greek. The Origin of the Announcement of Jesus Christ. That's the title of the work. Now think about this for a minute. Who would write, because if you, if you remember from last time, the announcement is Paul's thing, remember? And not everybody agreed with him. The Jewish Christians and James, they did not call their version of Christianity the announcement, right? And no. when Paul's writing to Romans, he never calls what the Romans, because he didn't establish that church in Rome, and he never, strikingly, he never calls what they believe the gospel, or the tr traditional translation is the gospel, to uh, euangelion in Greek. He never calls what they believe the gospel or the announcement. He always calls it what he was chosen by God. I was called, the first line of Romans, Paul the apostle set apart by God for the euangelion, the announcement. I was set apart. And then he refers to it as my announcement throughout Romans. Dr. Mason, right? real, yeah. real quick, my yeah. son, I'm going to keep teaching. I'm going to have it. I got to run and do something real quick for my son here. I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. My little seven-year-old is over here. <laughs> He's like not giving me a break here. One moment, please keep going. I will be listening. You, do, okay, you want me to keep going? Keep yeah. going. You just won't okay. see me on the screen. So oh, okay, that, that, okay, good. Uh, let us know when you come back. So, so the idea is this text, if you ask yourself who would be writing a text that says the origin how it began, how the announcement began, I would suggest to you, if Derek were here, I would ask him directly, and I think he might say, I hope he would say, hey, a follower of Paul, right? It would be a follower of Paul who's going to interpret Jesus' life in terms of the announcement, Paul's announcement. What do I mean by that? Well, look at the striking way this text, Mark, presents Jesus' life. Look at, look at in chapter one, after John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus came from where he was with John to Galilee, proclaiming the announcement of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The reign of God has come near. Repent and believe in the announcement. 
So this is exactly the same as what we saw Paul doing. That's Paul's apocalyptic teaching. So Jesus is here in Mark, only in Mark, as we'll see in a moment, only in Mark. Jesus is completely accommodated to this author's language system, right? He is interpreting Jesus' life in terms of the announcement, Paul's announcement. So he entitles his work that way. What I'm going to tell you about, so Paul, Paul told you about Jesus uh, dying, rising, and returning. That's it. But I'm going to tell you the origin of that, how it came about that Jesus came to die, rise, and will be returning. So already he actually has the, the, the confidence to put in Jesus' mouth the announcement. That's what Jesus goes around teaching in this text. It is not so in Matthew or Luke or John, but that's in this text what Jesus does. Uh, in uh, chap By the middle of the text in chapter 8, this author says, that Jesus said, those who want to save their life will lose it. Those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the announcement. Evangelion, the gospel in uh, most translations, will save it. Right. So he keeps repeating the importance of the announcement. Similarly in chapter 10, I tell you there's no one who is left. So the, here the disciples are arguing. Hey, what do we get out of this thing? I'll come back to that in a moment. The dim view of the disciples in this text. Uh, and he answers them, truly, I say to you, there's no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother, father, children, fields for my sake and for the sake of the announcement who will not receive a hundred times that here in this period and in the coming age eternal life. So the focus of this text, as Paul's letters, is on the return of Christ, the coming age, the imminent reign of God, the kingdom of God, which is about to break in and be ready for this, right? This is what the announcement is all about, continuing. In chapter 13, the so-called apocalyptic discourse, a big chunk of Mark is about the end time. Jesus, one of his, Jesus does not talk a lot in this gospel, but what he does talk a lot about in chapter 13 is predicting the end when the reign of God will break in. And he says, when will this happen? Uh, the disciples ask, like he says, uh, the temple will be destroyed. When will this happen? It won't, be hap it won't happen until the announcement is proclaimed to all the Gentiles or nations, to ethne. That's the same as Paul. You remember in Romans, Paul says, I've complete, I fully preached the, the announcement all around the Eastern Mediterranean. Now I'm moving to the West. Then chapter 14, this is where the woman, uh, you know, anoints Jesus' feet. Uh, and uh, this is in, in a little town called Bethany. And Jesus says there, I tell you, wherever the announcement is proclaimed in the entire world, what this woman did will be related in her memory. That's an odd way to say it, right? Wherever the announcement, like Paul's announcement is proclaimed. And then even in the long ending of Mark, uh, it's not authentic. It's not in the earliest manuscripts. But Jesus ends by saying, go into all the world and proclaim the announcement to the whole creation. So this text is about, indeed, what the title, what it says on the tin, right? The announcement is the subject. And what this author is doing, if you accept from our last time that the announcement is Paul's distinctive language, then it's quite amazing when you read Mark. Right. He has taken Jesus' life and put it in a Pauline, a Pauline filter, right? a kind of a wash of Paul. So Jesus is now preaching Paul stuff. Uh, Jesus is fully accommodated to Paul's announcement. So I, I want to come back to that, but let's take a quick look at the... Uh, oh, great. Hey, hey uh, very... I've been listening too, by the way. On oh, my phone okay. Now. So, you heard you, you heard it all, right? So I heard it all, yes, sir. So basically, what I'm suggesting is the the very fact that he uses this distinctive Pauline language uh, means that he's taken Jesus' life and poured it into a Pauline jug, right? Uh, he's presenting Jesus as Paul would, and he his text is about 
what lies behind Paul's announcement in this very distinctive way. So before we, I, I want to develop that by showing you that what this author likes is the same as what Paul likes. And what this author is against is the same as what Paul's against. So it's very much a Pauline text, a Pauline interpretation of Jesus' life. Not a, it's not an innocent kind of record of Jesus' life. It is the shaping of Jesus into a Pauline mold. Now, uh, but, but before we do that, just to see what the text is made of, it's got 16 chapters, right? And it's a very simple kind of outline. So chapter one, initiation events, Jesus' baptism, uh, the temptation in the wilderness, declaration as son of God, uh, go, and then the beginning of preaching the announcement. So Jesus is going around saying, believe the announcement, the end is coming, right? Then a bunch of conflict stories immediately from chapter two up to three, six, Jesus is in conflict with everybody, all the Jews, every Jewish teacher, the, the scribes, the Pharisees, Jesus is running into conflict. They're disagreeing. Then chapter four, uh, the author says he only taught in parables. Here are, here are like three or four examples. That's all I'm going to give you. But trust me, he only taught in parables. But the reason he taught in parables, strangely enough, was to throw people off the trail. And I want to come back to that at the very end of our session. Because he uses, you know, parables are supposed to be to help you understand things, right? They're, they're supposed to be analogies to help you. Like he says, uh, you know, in Luke, who is my neighbor? Ah, let me tell you a story about, you know, the Good Samaritan. This will illustrate who's my when When I say you should love your neighbor, here's a nice illustration of who a neighbor is, right? Right. right. But in Mark, Jesus gives parables. And then the, uh, the author says he did this in order that they will not understand and that they will, uh, like, not be forgiven. What? <laughs> and then he says... But he explained everything secretly to his disciples. But he didn't. He used parables to throw everyone else off the trail. And that's really interesting. Why would he do that? I want to come back to that at the very end. Because okay. it, might, it might have to do with the historical Jesus. Then you get a bunch of miracles and cures displaying his power, the feeding of the Gerizim demoniac uh, expelled you know, the, into the pigs in the lake and the, uh, the woman with the hemorrhage. And, and na nature miracles, the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, then more conflict stories in chapter 6 and the killing of John the Baptist. More miracle stories. And then you're already halfway through. So the text is arranged in thematic terms. It's not a chronological narrative in the first half. It's like here are some examples of conflict stories. Bang, 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 bang. Here are some examples of parables. One, two, three, four. Here are some more uh, some miracles to show his power. Here are some more conflicts. Here are some more miracles. Now we're halfway through. Uh, so these are unconnected, und undated episodes. Just like one day this happened, one day that happened. But they are arranged thematically in the first half. And they are, th they are lethal conflicts in Galilee. So then, already in chapter 8, in the middle repeated in chapter 9, repeated in chapter 10, you have this transition where Jesus began to teach them already that he must be killed, he will rise from the dead, or he will suffer, be killed and rise, he will be betrayed, he will kill, be killed, and he will rise. This is the beginning of the announcement. This is how Paul's announcement came about, in other words. So in the second half, this new information only to the disciples. There's a new set of conflict stories, but Jesus is now in Jerusalem. And now he gives this big apocalyptic speech. And then the, whole, the rest of it is his arrest and trial and crucifixion. Uh, and a very brief, very brief statement about the resurrection. But this is a connected narrative right. in, in his final week in Jerusalem. So the narrative slows from all these rapid fire examples to the final week, right? And, and a detailed account of leading up to his death and resurrection. That means that Jesus is not very talkative in this, uh, in this text. Um, 
it's all about his saving act of dying, rising, and returning. Very that, Pauline. Uh, yeah, very Pauline, right? Very Pauline. Because, I mean, Paul doesn't have many sayings of Christ at all anyway. He, no. He, yeah. He's only focused on the resurrected Lord. He's only focused on the yeah. death, burial, resurrection. And his whole anti, you know, going against the circumcision thing is quite interesting in this whole thing. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, I, yeah. So, so, so exactly. You can see, Derek, how this text matches the title, matches what's on the tin. This is how the announcement, Paul's announcement, Jesus died, he rose, he's coming again. This is the backstory of it. This is the origin of it. This is what happened. He came, he was Jewish, yes, but look at that. The plot to kill Jesus is hatched already at 3 6. Even after the, as soon as he arrives and starts teaching, they say in chapter one, oh, it's this, a new teaching. Like, who's this guy? You know, he's got authority like nobody else. And then in chapter three, verse six, the Pharisees and the Herodians begin to plot how to kill him. Right, right from the beginning. And so the entire story is, it's like a magnet. His death, uh, his final week in Jerusalem, his arrest, his, his beating, his crucifixion, that's the heart of it. Uh, one guy, Martin Kaler, called it, it's a passion story with a long introduction, right? Because it's basically about his death and resurrection, uh, his suffering, death and resurrection. And, and then simply in thematic terms, what leads up to it, right? That's what this text is. So it's really about how the announcement came to be. Namely, he was rejected by his people, by the Jews, right? So when is this text written? <laughs> we don't know, but we have some clues. On the one hand, it's removed from Jesus' life by at least a generation. How do we know that? Well, it knows this connected story of Jesus' arrest, trial, and execution, but the, the rest of it is put together from sort of random bits. Uh, here are some conflicts, here are some parables, but they've already been shaped into you know themes. Here are a few examples. So it, it suggests there's a distance. It's not like observation of Jesus' life. It's, it's removed by, let's say, you know, 20 years, I don't know, a generation of some kind. It's a thematic arrangement. And it shows how uh, in the parable of the sower, uh, I don't know if uh, you remember this, Derek, you probably do. You've got a really good memory. In chapter four, you have the first like uh, nine verses is the parable of the sower. A sower went out to sow, mm -hmm. you know, do you remember it? He threw yeah, oh, seed yeah. on different kinds of ground, right? Right. Do you know what you remember what comes after that in uh, 13 and following? I do not remember exactly. There's an interpretation of the parable. Okay. Because these disciples are so thick. You give a parable in order to illustrate. What you're asking me, what is the reign of God like? It's like a guy goes out to sow and plants, you know, and there's some good soil and some, and they say, uh, uh you know. What's that? Like, what, what What do you mean? And his, he gives an interpret. It's like, it's like telling a joke. And they say, okay, now what's the interpretation of the joke? You know, because you, you're not supposed to have to interpret a parable. But what's fascinating is when he does interpret the parable, it's all about the life of the church. It's the word is sown and the word falls in good ground or rocky ground. And the cares of the world come and take away the word. You know, things, it's talking about preaching in the church, right? So this is why it's clear that it's at least a generation removed from Jesus' lifetime, because things like this interpretation of a parable have grown up, right, have encrusted around the stories. Mm -hmm. and, and we know that's not necessary because the Gospel of Thomas has the parable of the sower in it without any interpretation. It, it makes as much sense as any other parable, just by itself. You don't need an interpretation, right? So parables are single point analogies to aid understanding. So interpreting one, turning it into an allegory and saying this part means this, this part means this, this part means this, that's a secondary kind of uh, step. On the other hand, it can't be way more than a generation later 
because it's used by Matthew and Luke Acts as a source. And Matthew already seems to be known by the early second century, right, in uh, Ignatius and possibly elsewhere. Although Mark is opposed to, let's say, Judaism, Judean law and custom, it doesn't have an elaborate description of the destruction of the temple, which you have in both Matthew and Luke. So it seems much closer somehow. It hasn't had time to kind of ferment, right? right. Uh, and then it's still very close to Paul's outlook and language, which Matthew, Luke, and others will reject. When they use Mark, they will, they will purify it of Paul's distinctive language and Paul's distinctive viewpoint. That's why they write their texts, because they don't like this Pauline interpretation of Jesus' life. They want to embed Jesus in Jewish culture as the Jewish Messiah on the one side, or in the case of John, as a wisdom, as the one who brings truth and wisdom into the world. All right, so they, they're not having Paul's, uh, Paul's thing. So the mm. fact that it's so close to Paul's language and outlook also suggests it's not that far away from Paul. And then I would like to draw your attention to this very cute passage in, uh, in, in Mark 15. So I think we talked about this before, Derek, in, in the different context, how you remember this story, Jesus is on his way to the to crucifixion. He's been given a cross, but they forced a certain passerby, Simon from mm -hmm. Cyrene, North Africa, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. Now, this must have good Josephus connections. <laughs> Mr. Josephus himself is on. <laughs> Hold on, let me let me switch you. I gotta have your facial expressions here. So uh, go ahead and tell us what's going on here, Doctor. Well, <laughs> let, I, I wanted to ask you: Why would somebody say, "Okay, I want to tell you a story," and there was a certain uh, a certain uh, Bob from uh, the Arctic Circle? Oh, he's the father of uh, of Bill and and Jim. His audience must know or have an idea who Rufus and so and so is. They've got to be relevant. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And the, the amazing thing is that although Matthew and Luke take over this story, they have Simon carrying the cross. They're following Mark as a source. They both drop out Alexander and Rufus. Why? Probably because they're not relevant anymore. Nobody know. knows who the heck they are. Right. right. No, nobody knows who Alexander... Yeah. There's no point saying, if I got up and said, you know, that, 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 was, that was Bob, he's the, by the way, he's the father of Bill and George. And if you didn't know who Bill and George were, you'd look at me like, why are you telling me that? Yeah. I don't, I don't know who these people are, right? Just tell me there was a certain guy named Bob. Okay, I can buy that. But if you tell me he's the father of these people, well, that doesn't mean anything to me. So I think it's very clear that... Um, What's going on here? Whoever wrote this text has two guys in the group who are two brothers, Alexander and Rufus, and they said, hey, you know what? We heard from our dad that he was visiting Jerusalem from Cyrene, North Africa, just at that time. And actually, he was forced to carry Jesus' cross. Wow. And so Mark, the guy writing this, says, and you know what? They come because remember in the Gospel of John, he doesn't know anything about this. He says explicitly, the fourth gospel, John, says explicitly that Jesus was compelled to carry his own cross. Hmm. He doesn't he doesn't know this story. So so Mark knows the story only because he's got two chaps in this group, two brothers who said, Hey, our dad. Now it doesn't mean that it happened. Um, their dad who I don't know their dad, so you know he. Who knows? Uh, dads have been known to tell, you know, like if you go fishing or hunting or whatever, you know, dads have been known to 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 embellish stories, right? So it's not beyond the realm of uh, imagination that their father said, "Yeah, you know what? I was in Jerusalem. I had to carry a guy's cross once, 
I, I'm sure it was this guy. I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was Jesus, actually. Well, do we know that? No. But anyway, the point is, this author knows this, th these people, and that's where he gets the story from. Matthew and Luke, when they, they're copying his story, and they both say, eh, we don't need to say Alexander and Rufus because we don't know who these people were, and our readers won't know who they were. So anyway, I think this is very cool because it, it's a little... It's a little bit like that baptism of the house of Stephanus and stuff in, in Roman. It's a Romans. It's a little bit of um, a, a human touch, right? That that shows this is not that far removed. It's about a generation removed. So Simon's no longer around, but Alexander and Rufus are adults in his group. We don't know how old, and they're relating this story from their father. But this tends to confirm, I mean, I, we can't be specific. I, we don't know. Uh, but it tends to confirm that if Jesus died around 30, somewhere in the, say, the 60s, late 60s, early 70s, somewhere in there, would make the best sense of all of this evidence together, right? The, the fact that some time has gone by to allow for the interpretation of the parable of the sower, the streamlining of these, these stories into neat units, but not too much time, so that it's still used as a source by Matthew and Luke Acts uh, in the next generation. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me. So at the bare minimum would be these times. Uh, however, dating Mark, my question would be, and maybe we're skipping around. Uh, the woe saying Jesus, right? This Jesus Ben Ananias figure from Josephus. I wondered if this made evidence for dating mark to the time in which this is already established by Josephus. This is something already written. Um, yeah. 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 The, the, the Jesus pet and nice. It's funny. I don't know if, uh, I don't know if the person who wrote to me about this is one of your viewers, uh, but somebody wrote to me about this exact question, uh, arguing quite strenuously that, uh, Mark that the figure of Jesus is somehow borrowing from Josephus's, Jesus Ben Ananias. Right. Um, I I have to say, I don't think that's at all plausible. Um, anything's possible, but it doesn't make sense of either text. The Jesus Ben Ananias is somebody who lives in Jerusalem, and he he for seven years straight, according to Josephus, Josephus has seven omens. He says that were around before the destruction of the temple in seventy, and the seventh of the omens was that this guy, so the others were like a cow giving birth to a lamb, right. uh, ba armies battling in the heavens, the massive temple door, which usually required 20 men to open, opened all by itself, uh, you know, things like that. These are omens. And uh, probably the cow didn't give birth to the lamb. Probably <laughs> there weren't really armies in the heaven fighting, you know, but this is ancient stuff. And the, the seventh one, was that this guy for seven years nonstop went around saying, you know, woe to the bridegroom, woe to the bride in Jeremianic verse for seven years, day and night, nonstop. Well, nothing really fits. I mean, he's not from Galilee. He's not, he's at a different time. Jesus is a very common name. You know, he's one of the more common, Yeshua, Yehoshua, it's a very common name. Uh, Josephus has, has a couple of dozen or three dozen, maybe two and a half dozen Jesuses. Uh, Joshua is is Jesus in the Greek translation. So, so it's th there's not that much similarity actually between these guys, and they live at different places and different times and do different things. So I don't don't really see what the correspondence is. Uh, certainly not a telling one to make it you know a dependence. I think. I guess it's just the woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Woe to you, so and so. But that's but that's not but that's not what Jesus Ben Ananias says. Uh, not at all, right? Okay. Uh, Je Jesus is uh, much more much differently oriented from that. No, that's a general. Jesus Ben Ananias is just basically woeing everybody uh, about the destruction of Jerusalem. That's all he does. That's his thing. He's a one trick pony. He's got a, like a placard, you know, the the end is nigh. That's that kind of thing, and. His fate is completely different. Uh, he's not crucified. He's beaten up, and they're thinking of crucifying him. And then they, they decide he's a madman, so they release him, and that's it. And he dies by being hit by a stone. 
uh, during the siege of Jerusalem, right? So it's a it's like a completely different story. Got um, it. Yeah. Okay. Anyhow, what I want to what I want to point out is that this guy to to sort of strengthen the idea that this is a Pauline uh, interpretation of Jesus' life, uh, according to the the announcement, is that. He, this author is for the same things as Paul, and some of these may surprise your viewers. So we saw already the title. Jesus goes around claiming to be uh, speaking the announcement. That's what he does in Mark. Uh, believe the announcement. That's that's his message. Believe the Aeongelion uh, uh, that, that is Paul's. And then, you know, we already said uh, his fir the first reaction to him is it's a new teaching it's not jewish it's not in, in jewish tradition it's a new teaching and so the whole magnet is toward his death and resurrection in this text and the imminence of christ's return so he's th the same thing as paul right we who are alive and remain mm. uh that's in the apocalyptic discourse that's how it is in in chapter nine this jesus says i tell you truly there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the reign of God come with power. Right. That's that's Paul, right? It's the same thing. Jesus' teaching is not central. Even the parables are there to throw people off the track, right? To show their lack of understanding. And what dominates this text is the apocalyptic discourse, which sounds very much like Paul. The announcement must first be preached to all the na nations or Gentiles. And like uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, you ask me when? Nobody knows. Even the angels of heaven don't know. Mm. And not even not even the Son, not even me. I don't know. Uh, but only the Father in heaven. So just be alert. You don't know when the end will come. All right? This is very apocalyptic, this text. Uh, really? and, and the non-disciples are okay. Right? There's this episode. Uh, I'll, I'll stop in a second, Derek, just yes, to sir. finish this thought. Um, th th there's a really interesting passage where the disciples, these you know, fortunate followers of Jesus say, hey, we saw another guy teaching in your name and casting out devils. We tried to stop him because he's not one of us. <laughs> and Jesus said, don't stop him. Just because he's not one of us, he's still doing my work, right? And that's extremely interesting, right? Because it fits with Paul. Uh, he's not one of the 12, and the 12 think they're special, Right. And this author is saying, no, nah, not so special. Go ahead, Derek. No, Derek, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, we got a super chat from Ben, and he is in the vein of Mark here saying, any thoughts on Mark ending without any resurrection appearances to the 12? Yeah. Is it relevant to the Pauline flavor of the text? And that's yeah. an interesting. Ben, the way you ask that, is not like the typical everyone. Why did Mark end? And there's no real scene of them appearing to the 12. But no. This is interesting. Do you have any thoughts on that one? No, that's a perfect question. That's exactly right. And I think it, it suits. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to it, uh, Ben, uh, towards uh, towards the end. It's a really good question. You want me to screenshot uh, that one and keep it for the end? Yeah, yeah, please. please okay, do. thank you yeah. so much for the super chat. And then, uh, look, yeah. for those who are tuning in, um, just remember, this is church. And if you don't believe like we do, uh, you can get baptized in Myth Vision uh, sauce. Okay. So <laughs> welcome to the channel and thanks for tuning in. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> so this guy is for the same things that Paul is for. And and also it's the Gentiles who respond best to his to Jesus' teaching. So in this text, in this relatively short text, he goes twice to visit the Decapolis cities, which are Greek cities near Judea, like Gadara, Gerizza, uh, Hippos, uh, you know, Skitopolis, uh, they are not part of Judea. They're not Jewish cities. And he goes, visits them twice, right? He goes off to Tyre, which is up in Lebanon today. And he has, and, and then he visits a Syrophoenician woman and all that. Some of that is taken over into Mark, into Matthew and, and Luke. But Mark is the one who first puts it all together, and it it conveys this Pauline idea of Jesus. He's teaching the announcement. He has great success with Gentiles. He endorses those who are not among the 12, right? And now 
now it gets really interesting. Really, I maybe I think this might surprise some of your viewers. This is some of the most interesting stuff in Mark, I think. What does he oppose? Well, first of all, he nullifies Jewish law, right? Uh, in chapter 7, verse 19, there's a saying there, you know, uh, what makes what, about what food is clean and unclean. And Jesus says there, it's not what goes into you that makes you unclean. It's what comes out. It's your language, your words, your speech that make you. Well, this is, I mean, a Jewish person could say that in the sense it's not as important what goes into you as what comes out of you. But this author in his own voice adds, thus he declared all foods clean. Well, that's a flat contradiction of Deuteronomy 14, which has the very clear food laws about what Jews cannot eat and, and can eat, right, in the air of land animals and from the sea. And Jesus now just <laughs> in a stroke, according to this author, he declares all food clean. Wow. Okay, so he's living in Judea, and now he's just not bothering anymore with Jewish law. Matthew and Luke both omit that line because they don't like it at all, right? They don't believe, they don't agree with it. All the Jewish leaders oppose him and want him killed. Uh, so he's been fighting with priests, Pharisees, scribes. Well, the priests don't come up until later, but they are in cahoots with the Pharisees, the scribes, and the Sadducees. He just debates them all, and the Jewish leadership as a whole wants him dead. So. The plot of the story is right from the beginning, he appears, he's rejected, and he's soon crucified. So that's the origin of the announcement. That's how Jesus came to die and rise. Matthew postpones this conflict by several chapters to mitigate its influence, and Luke omits it altogether because he, he has a different idea. In Luke, the Pharisees are inviting Jesus to dinner all the time, three times in Luke. The Pharisees uh, say, teacher, come to dinner with us. And he's, you know, he's having a chat with them at dinner. That never happens in Mark, right? Now, here's, here's where it gets, here is where the rubber hits the road, my friends. Jesus' family. Now, think about this. Mark does not have a birth narrative, right? It just begins with Jesus being baptized in, in the wilderness. What does that mean? Well, you don't have the stories in Matthew about uh, Mary uh, and Joseph receiving visions or in uh, Luke about Mary, the Magnificat, you know, the, the virgin birth, None of, or, or John the Baptist recognizing Jesus in the womb. None of that is there in Mark. None of it. So if you don't assume that, if you leave all that to one side, What's going to be the case when Jesus starts performing miracles, starts getting into conflict, serious conflict with the big leaders of the day? His family, and they are spelled out, his mother, Mary. There's, by the way, there's no Joseph in this story. There's no Joseph in Mark. So whereas in Matthew, he, Jesus is the son of the carpenter or, or technical work or builder, uh, Joseph, in Mark, it's Jesus himself who is that who has that trade, because there's no Joseph. So Mary, his mother, and his brothers, who include James, his name is spelled out, they lack any faith in him. They think he is crazy. That's what the text says. And I want to show you something here, because it's 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 glossed over in translations in most uh, church translations, it's glossed over. So the story is, in 321, large crowds have been following Jesus to hear him. When his family heard about it, because his family is over in Nazareth, central South Galilee, he is he's closer to the lake, uh, of the east of central Galilee, South Galilee. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for they were saying, he's lost his mind. Now, what most translations do with that is they, they take the second they were saying and translate it as people were saying, okay? So that his family hears about his crowds, and then they hear that people are saying, 
he's crazy. And so they go to kind of save him. But that's not what the Greek says. It says they were saying. And normally in Greek, the they, like in English, the pronoun represents the subject that was just announced. Mm -hmm. So when his family heard it, they went out to restrain him because they were saying he's lost his mind. That's, I think, the only way to read this passage properly because uh, when they, then, then Matthew and Luke, by the way, this is one of those green bits in, in Matthew, in Mark, if you remember the green bits, there are very few of them that are o omitted by Matthew and Luke. This is omitted by Matthew and Luke. <laughs> I wonder it, why, you know? Because it doesn't oh, fit with, <laughs> it doesn't fit with the birth narrative, right? I mean, it would make no sense at all in those, in Matthew or in Luke, when you've had all these heavenly visions and Mary knows perfectly well who Jesus is in those right. stories, it would make no sense for her to say such things. Yeah, how would she forget the angel yeah. Gabriel appears to her and tells her, and right. oh, you know this uh, crazy appearance of an angel? He's crazy. Why would he think such a thing? It's like, yeah, it no. makes no sense. So yeah, you're right. And then immediately after that, so they leave home. So, so the author does this. He has a famous technique called the Markin sandwich, a very technical term, uh, Markin sandwich. Uh, it's a like an ABA pattern. That is, he, he says one thing, he, he inserts something else like the bologna sandwich, you know, and then he comes back to the bread on the other side. So that's what he does here. His family hears about it and they leave home. Okay, leave that story now. So they're, they're coming out to get him because they think he's lost his mind. And the scribes who came from Jerusalem said he has Beelzebul. Beelzebul, Beelzebul. Baal is the name of uh, a demon. Right? It's a common name of, the, of Satan, the head demon. And by the ruler of demons, he's casting out demons. So you've got his family saying he's crazy. And these guys saying, well, he's, he's demon-possessed. That's why he's able to cast out demons. Now, Jesus responds to that accusation and says, well, that you would mean I'm casting out. That doesn't make any sense. If, if I'm working for Satan, why am I casting out demons? Uh, a house divided against itself doesn't work. Uh, so, you know, re you got to rethink this. I'm not working for Satan. And then he says, and now in a summary statement, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they said he has an unclean spirit. Now, he's not talking in abstractions here. He's saying that these people, who are these people? The scribes from Jerusalem. They, are, they can never be forgiven. The Jewish leaders are guilty of an eternal sin. They can never be forgiven for this because they rejected Jesus, right? They, uh, they, they accused him of being in league with Satan. That's unforgivable. And that's a serious statement, right? And that fits a bit with Paul. In uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 to 16, the Jews drove us out uh, and, uh, and, and, and um, you know, um, prevent us from speaking to the nations, but God's wrath has come on them at the end. They're, they're, they are to be punished. Um, so now if you, the end of the sandwich, the Markin sandwich, the family shows up, right? So we last saw them in 321. They were leaving their home in Nazareth. Now they've shown up where Jesus is. Look what happens. His mother and his brothers came and standing outside where he was with all the crowds around him, they called to him. And a crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, oh, your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. He replied, who are my mother and my brothers? You are my mother and my brothers. Oh, wow. Here are my mother. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister. Wow, this is amazing, right? Right. Now, Matthew and Luke both have a version of this, but they shrink it and they recontextualize it. But what they don't have is the beginning part where the family came to arrest him, seize him, because they crazy. thought he was crazy, right? Right. So, so there in those texts, it turns into a more general abstract statement. Like, you know, of course, of course he was, he loved his mother 
uh, and, you know, the, the, the birth stories are there in Matthew and Luke. So that relativizes everything. In this account, not so. You don't have any birth story. And, Jesus, and Mark's Jesus is really dissing his family, right? He's absolutely rejecting them. And now if you think about that in Pauline terms, Jesus' family are ah. the ones running the show in Jerusalem. Jesus' brother James is the guy who's the head kind of honcho that everybody has to kind of report to, right, in Jerusalem. And here you have a text that is so deeply Pauline, right? It is about how Paul's announcement came about, and it's showing the inveterate hostility of the Jews who are eternally blamed for rejecting him and his family and his students, right? They don't know who he is. Uh, it's rather those who do Jesus' will who really understand him, so not, not his family, right? This, this is amazing. I've got, and by the way, uh, I just want to say thank you to um, Pet Mark for the super chat. I will be getting your super chats, guys. I feel like we'll have plenty of time to get to them and sit with them at the end of this episode. This is what, what you and me will really dig. I want to make sure we get to the presentation. Feel free to super chat. Um, that way I can screenshot it and keep it relevant. At the end, we will really do a deep dive. But here's something interesting for the mythicist historicist argument. What happens often is people go to Paul. Paul's your earliest source. They see Paul, first generation Christian. He doesn't really care about any earthly ministry of Jesus. He doesn't elaborate on the teachings. He doesn't care about a teaching Jesus. He cares about a heavenly Christ. And so right there alone, they go, well, he could easily have been just an angel figure. I mean, even Bart Ehrman thinks there's some significance to the idea that uh, he, he was angelic pre, prior to being born and whatnot. He comes into the earth. Paul argues this in Philippians. So then all of a sudden you get to the Gospels, and what they do is they go, well, the Gospels are so fictional that they've you hemorized even a family or they've invented a family for Jesus. So when you see James, the brother of the Lord, they look in, in Paul's letters, they say, brother of the Lord either means fellow Christian, as, as uh, Richard Carrier would say, some a form of a Christian in some way, or um, Dr. Price argues potentially pillars of the Jerusalem church. And there's three pillars and that it was known. And uh, I can't remember what, but the point I'm making is how far of a leap would it be if you do look at the gospels and you see it's whoever Mark is or the author that they claim Mark is like, why would he change completely Paul's meaning of what brother of the Lord means to make it an actual brother and his mother and like sisters and whatnot in the gospels. Yeah. For yeah. me, it seems like that would be ad hoc. I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm not at all ruling that out for those who are mythicists. Cause I was, I'm saying what seems to be most Occam's razor to me is that here, that here they are. And exactly what you're saying the brother of the Lord, these guys that Paul is competing with, okay, are being shamed right yeah. here in the gospel and yeah. saying even they didn't believe in him and yeah. they're knuckleheads. Yeah. But this leads me to another question that I'm, we're going to get to. I'd like to ask because some scholars yeah. answer this differently. And yeah. it really comes down to why are all of them so ignorant in this uh, episode? Some people say Paul – Others say, well, just look at Mimesis, look at the Old Testament, look at how they murmured in the wilderness. Could it be both? Could it be? So we'll get there. I just think this is it's too much. I wonder if Paul's ministry is really reflected here in saying, look, these 12 numb nuts, anything they knew was from the spirit of God, not anything that they understood. And it yeah. takes away the credit of these guys. So anyway, I, I he, 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 he systematically undermines the credibility of both Jesus family, which is quite shocking, right? Really. And it's, as I say, the translations of our text kind of, kind of gloss over this and nobody really reads Mark on its own. They tend to read Matthew or, or Luke. Right. But, but then you notice that Mark is really kind of pretty radical here. Uh, Jesus own family clearly uh, do not understand what he's about. And, and they will be named in chapter six. 
uh, there's no doubt about it, picking up on what you said, Derek. He came to his own hometown. His students followed him. I'm translating disciples as students. I think it's better translation. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many who heard him were astounded. They said, where does man get all this? What's all this wisdom that's been given him? What deeds of power are being done? Isn't this the builder? Yeah, not the son of the builder. In, in Matthew, it becomes the son of the builder because hmm. Joseph is around, right? But here, he's just the builder. So isn't it, he's like a construction, he's like you, uh, Derek, you were a construction worker, right? Um, I was, yes. Yeah, uh, and my son's a construction worker. Um, isn't this the construction worker? Uh, the, the son of Mary and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon and are not all his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Well, Notice that, I mean, James is quite explicitly mentioned as, as, a, as, a, as a nobody, right? He's just part of the family, the same family that came to arrest him. And Jesus has spelled out before, who are my mother and my brothers, right? Nobody. Uh, you all are because you do the will of God. They're nobody special. That's just like Galatians 2. Those who are reputed to be pillars... I don't care what they are. They're, they're nothing to me, right? Uh, this is very much a Pauline, a Pauline text. So no birth story, no Joseph, no angelic announcements. Family know nothing about Jesus' divine origin, and therefore he repudiates his family. So this is to point out again that that's one of the little bits in Mark that is not taken over into uh, the other texts. Wow. Look uh, at that. <laughs> now, that's not the only thing. Now we get to the disciples. These 12 students lack understanding. Even So even though the author goes to great pains to say, Jesus used parables to throw everyone else off the trail, but he explained everything in detail to his disciples. But they understand nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the amazing thing. So that, that's what he says in 434. After giving some examples of parables, he says he used them to confuse the outsiders, but he explained everything to his disciples. So chapter six, after the 5,000 are fed, he walks on the water. He says they didn't understand because their hearts were hardened. Now, Matthew, when he sees that, says, no, no, wait a minute. That's no good. Uh, so he has Peter then walking on the water, right, as a right. sign of faith. And Jesus endorses him, except Peter slips because his faith weakens. But he does, you know, at least he gives it a go. Uh, and there's a validation, and the disciples worship Jesus then, right? That's It ends on a high note in Matthew, not in Mark. In Mark, it's just, oh, Jesus walks on the water. Oh, he fed the 5,000. They, they don't understand. You know, their hearts are hardened. They don't get it. What's this? Who is this guy? We don't understand. Um, then again, in chapter 8, so he's already fed 5,000, right? An amazing miracle, the loaves and the fishes, extended to feed 5,000 people. Now, just two chapters later, they're in the desert again, the wilderness. Now there are 4,000 people present. And... Jesus says, you know, it's time for some food. And they say, how can one feed 4,000 people in the desert? Well, it just, it well, just happened, man. Guys, well, you know, think back. You, you've, you've seen this before. Well, so Luke omits the story, right? He just says, come on now. <laughs> this, is, this is ridiculous. So uh, it's not going to work. Similarly, a few lines later, He's telling them to beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. They think, oh, there's some new brand of uh, yeast of uh, the Pharisees. They oh, think he's talking about bread. And he chastises them and says, uh, come on, guys. I'm not talking about bread. I'm using like a metaphor here, you know, for <laughs> the, the, the bad teaching of the Pharisees, right? Stay away from them. Matthew changes it. Luke omits it again, says, I don't believe this. This is really dissing 
the the, the disciples. Mm. Same chapter, same chapter. Peter rebukes Jesus for predicting his death when he begins to say, and I'm going to have to die and rise again. And Peter turns and says, no, 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 you don't. that's not going to happen. And Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. Your mind is on human things. Now, Matthew and Luke, neither of them can abide this, right? So that's where Matthew changes the story, the ending, to have... Uh, to have Peter declare him the Messiah. And uh, Jesus says, you are the rock and I will build my church and I give you the keys of the kingdom. That's all in Matthew. That's not in Mark, right? Luke just omits the story again. <laughs> that, that, that's why he omits, so, he omits so much of Mark because he just, he just doesn't think it works. So not only, not only do they lack understanding at every turn and their hearts are hardened, they don't get it. But he has, Mark has some really curious stories about what they do care about. And what they do care about is their own status. And this fits with the Pauline idea, right? These are guys, they, yes, they were Jesus students, but they didn't understand Jesus. And all they care about is the fact that they were with Jesus. And so they think that makes them special. So for example, <laughs> they're walking along the road in chapter 9, and uh, they're arguing about who's the greatest <laughs> among them. I think I'm the greatest. Now, come on, man. I'm, I'm really the greatest. You know I'm better than that. Yeah. So Matthew, here in this case, Matthew omits it, right? He says, no, that's, it's not my image of these guys. And Luke modifies it to take the edge off it. Um, that's a, a fan, the, the very best example of this is in chapter 10, 35 to 41. So he's just predicted again. He's just predicted in 31 to 33 that he's going to have to die. His suffering is ahead. It's a very somber moment, right, in the text. He's, he's going to have to, he's going to suffer at the hands of the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. And then, then the end will come and the reign of God will arrive, right? And so James and John say, oh, okay. When the reign of God comes, can we sit uh, on your right hand and on your left hand? And <laughs> like, come on, guys, he's just been talking about all the suffering ahead. And they think, oh, yeah, okay, but the reign of God is coming. Can we just reserve a place on your right and on your left? The other disciples get very angry with them because they're jealous. In Matthew, in Matthew, he changes the story in the most charming way. It's now the mother of James and John who asked the question. Hmm. Now, what do you think? What do you think, Derek? Is the, they're taking it, it off of the? He's taking Matthew's taking it the burden off of these guys every yeah. time he can to yeah. protect it. And this makes me think, Matthew. I'm not sure how late in the game this is, but. It, the church is established. There yeah. is some orthodoxy happening yeah. in Matthew's yeah. on, the, on the road. So, yeah. or some yeah. form of, of something that's trying to yeah. make them establish the 12 and maybe even unite Paul to some degree. Maybe. Um, I don't know because Matthew seven and the whole workers of lawlessness thing, it's, it's got me thinking maybe this is a polemic, uh, you know, but yeah, but yeah I think they're, he's taking the burden off. And by the way, I, I, Del Bro says, no question, just want to acknowledge your effort and work. So thank you for the super chat, Del. I really appreciate it, my friend. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks for passing that along. But we, we've all had mothers, and we know perfectly well this is what every mother in all of human history, probably going back to you know, our, our, our um, pre-human ancestors, was doing, was looking out for their, for their kids looking out for their children. Uh, that's what mothers do, right? They want the best for them. So it's a perfectly charming thing, scenario, when the mother says, can my boys, you know, I, just a modest request, can my boys be on your right hand? You're, it's not their fault, right? Every yeah. mother's gonna be like that. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. I think it's a brilliant, so he's, it's again, I think, not, not exactly proof, but it's good evidence that Matthew is using Mark as a source. But he has to, because it's got good source information, but at every turn, he's modifying it, right, to suit his own agenda. Mm. Now, now we get to the serious stuff. 
all of these disciples turn out to be bad eggs. Judas betrays, like he's one of the 12. When Judas is introduced way back in uh, chapter 3, I think, he's introduced as one of the 12 who betrayed Jesus. Mm. And Peter, like the big shot in Jerusalem, the rock, according to Matthew, the, the story closes with Peter's breakdown. And it's never he's never, so to speak, redeemed. He's never uh, restored. He's never rehabilitated. Uh, he denies Jesus when he said he wouldn't. He swore black and blue he would never do that. He did, did it repeatedly, and then he collapses. And that's the last we see of him. So this story is actually, it's pretty, it's, pr it's pretty cold, right? Oh, uh, in, in chapter 14, so getting close to the end, Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12, this author keeps driving home the fact that he was one of the 12 who betrayed, he went off just right after dinner, went to the chief priest to get some money to betray Jesus. And Jesus curses him. Woe to the, the one by whom the Son of Man goes. Right? Uh, then he says a few lines later, look, you're all going to desert me. And they all deny it vociferously. We would never desert you. Never in a million years. We are your closest supporters. We never. But as soon as they get to the garden after dinner, they fall asleep. And Jesus is you know, pouring his heart out and, and just in agony. And he turns around and they're all snoring, right? And says, Can't, he says, couldn't you even stay awake like an hour with me? You, you, you people say you'd never desert me. You're, you've got my back. Come on, you, you just fell asleep immediately. You didn't even, you, you didn't even try. And then in verse fifty, the ultimate is they all scatter. They all take off exactly like Jesus said. You're useless. You're all you're all gonna desert me. The one who sticks around not with him, but he hangs around the courtyard is Peter. And now Peter, it's laid out in great excruciating detail. The story shows how Peter disowns Jesus, not once, not twice, but three times. And then he broke down and wept. And that's it. Now, in Matthew and Luke, of course, that's not it. Then he's kind of redeemed because you have the more elaborate resurrection stories. And Peter is at the head of the disciples who are going out to witness the resurrection. And then in, in Luke Acts, he will become like the main guy, right, of the, uh, the leaders of the apostles. That's not the case in Mark. Then finally, the, the question I guess Ben asked a, a long time ago. Uh, so this, this text ends with a very abrupt story where the women go out to, uh, to, to uh, anoint Jesus' body and the, the stone is rolled away and there's nobody there. And the angel says, go and tell his disciples and Peter to go to Galilee. So what do they do? Do they go and tell the disciples and Peter to go they to Galilee? Told no one. They went out and fled in terror and amazement and said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. End of story. Now, <laughs> this is really quite an amazing story, right? It's, it's I would argue, from a very profoundly Pauline perspective, it's all about... Jesus' saving work, the end of the age, Jesus returning from heaven, the imminent end of the age. There is some standing here who will not taste death before the reign of God comes. So, and what it's for, it's, it's down the line with Paul. What it's against, it's down the line with Paul. Uh, rejects Jewish law, declares the law over and finished with, no, no longer valid. Uh, rejects the authority of the disciples. They don't know anything. Yes, they were the disciples, but come on, they're not reliable. They betrayed Jesus. They fled from Jesus. They didn't understand anything Jesus taught them in spite of his best efforts. 
the family, come on, forget about it. Uh, the family, they went to arrest him. They tried to seize him. And Jesus disowned them and said, whoever does my work is my family, not those guys. Is right? it possible, Dr. Mason, that the reason they, uh, they told no one, so to speak, uh, is this kind of a jab at Paul's idea of saying, I learned this from none of these guys. In fact, yeah. they didn't really. Thank you. Yeah. There was no truth being relayed to them even. It took the yeah. revelation of Jesus to me personally. And that's why they told, they ran and told no one. I think that you, Derek, are right on the money there. Woo. That this, this fits with Paul's. Remember, we looked at Paul's briefly. We looked at Paul's account of the resurrection. How does he know that Jesus is risen? Nothing about an empty tomb. It's got nothing to do with that. He knows because Jesus appeared to him. And he appeared to him the same way, he makes this very clear, that he appeared to everybody else who saw him, to Peter, to James, to the others. They all saw him the same way Paul did. And it, it's, got, it's just appearances. It, there's no need for an empty tomb in this scenario, right? It's mm. just that, Jesus has become, in Paul's language, a life-giving spirit, right? And not flesh and bones, not flesh and blood, pardon me. Flesh and bones is in, in Luke, uh, but not that. Uh, he's become a life-giving spirit. So he can be seen when he appears. Uh, yes, and exactly. So the, the empty tomb, that whole thing is irrelevant. And, they, and Paul cannot have gotten it from those people. Uh, because they didn't say anything. The women didn't say anything to anybody. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's fascinating, right? I mean, it it's, fas it's fascinating. And then when you look at what Matthew and Luke do with this, so we began by seeing that that apparently they used Mark as a source. But what's really amazing is they, they kind of had to use him because he provided a narrative spine. He's got material they can use, but they constantly either omit something they don't like or they transform it, and even with his core language. So let's have a, have a look at this. Matthew, in, instead of the origin of the announcement, right? that's Mark's title, look at his title instead. He says, no, I don't like that title. Here's my title. The book of the Genesis of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That is a different title, right, altogether. And what does that tell you immediately in Matthew about the flavor of the book? Um, it's trying to it's trying to take it and, and rewrite another narrative, right? It's trying to rewrite another Moses narrative. Yeah, yeah. The book of the Genesis. Now he's making a pun on the the book of Genesis, but uh, Genesis Genesis creation. means origin and it means birth. Okay. And so he's actually getting a two or three for one with this one word because he's about to describe the birth of Jesus, the origin of Jesus, but not, not Mark's use of the word origin. It's a, Mark uses the Greek word arche, the origin of the announcement. <laughs> Matthew's got nothing to do with the announcement. Forget about the announcement. That's not what Jesus was about. Jesus is the Messiah, son of David, son of Abraham. And he immediately opens then with a genealogy. Genesis also means genealogy. So it's like a four for one uh, word. It refers to, it, it echoes the book of Genesis. It refers to the birth of Jesus that's about to happen, that he's gonna describe, and the genealogy of Jesus going back through uh, David to Abraham. So he's got a different Jesus altogether. And everything that happens to Jesus is within the scope of Jewish law and culture in this text. He teaches wholly within that world, and he goes only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, as he stresses in chapter 10. And of course, Jesus knows, Jesus' family knows his identity with absolute certainty because they've been visited by angels, and the whole family and the disciples are all validated. And Jesus demands interpretation or observance of the law. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophet. I didn't come to abolish. I tell you till heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law 
And whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so will be called least in the kingdom. So this is like a massive all right, a reversion. He, he cannot say what Mark said. Jesus declared all foods clean. That just does away with the dietary laws. That's not Matthew, right? Matthew's not having any of that. And he endorses the disciples as trustworthy authorities. So in chapter 16, where Peter says, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God, Jesus answers, you know, my father revealed this to you. You are Peter. I will build my rock. This is all Matthew, right? It's all Matthew. Now, what's really interesting here, what about this word, euangelion, announcement? Because we've seen that it's a key word for Mark. But look at what happens when Matthew takes over these passages. So we just saw that he, he drops it out of the title. That's not going to be his title. Then where Mark says, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the announcement of God. <laughs> da, 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 Matthew da, da, just da. says, no, 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 he, <laughs> he did not. He did not do that. <laughs> uh, and then uh, he says, namely, the reign of God has come near. Repent and trust in the announcement. Well, no. Jesus began to proclaim, repent for the reign of heaven is at hand. Not the announcement. Forget about the announcement. In eight, those who lose their life for my sake and the sake of the announcement will save it. No, 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 no. For, scrub the announcement. It's got nothing to do with the announcement. It's just those who lose their life for my sake. No. Uh, so when, when he does use, he takes over the word three times, but he now it's not the announcement. It's the announcement of the reign of God or the reign of heaven in, uh, in Matthew's terminology, usually. Uh, so he twists and he either omits uh, Mark's announcement language or he twists it into the announcement of the reign of heaven, which is his language, right? That's Matthew's language. So no one who's left house or brothers, we saw this passage, uh, for the sake of the announcement. No, for the sake of my name. That woman's uh, anointing of his feet. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. The uh, apocalyptic discourse in, in 13. The announcement must be proclaimed to all nations. Scrubbed. It's gone. Now the woman's anointing of his feet, whatever, wherever the announcement is proclaimed. No, wherever this message is proclaimed that I've been teaching in Matthew, not the announcement. So Paul's announcement is effectively scrubbed out of Matthew. Uh, he just gets rid of it altogether. Real quick, if you don't yeah. mind. I yeah, no, go ahead. He, he seems to be a, a Torah observant Christian. Yeah, so yeah. When you do have at the end of Matthew this now go into the nations making disciples, yeah. notice something weird there probably going on. Um, are they converting? Are they trying to say uh, in the Matthew gospel, are they going out there saying, look, uh, you need to come to this Torah observant Christianity. Uh, we're going to try and convert you guys. Technically, they're going out there. And they're doing the exact thing that Paul's opponents are, so to speak, doing. Yeah. To people. I think, again, Derek, and this is not flattery. It's just I happen to think you are dead on, dead on. Um, I have a few brain cells. Good. Yeah, Good. I, no, I think it's exactly right. Because if you just say, like, it's often been thought that Matthew is simply a Jewish Christian gospel, right? That is Jews who follow Jesus like Matthew. But, but you notice something really significant there. It's actually uh, proselytizing, converting people to follow the law, right? And also what you find repeatedly in Matthew is that the sons of the kingdom, that is the Jews, the natural heirs, are cast out into outer darkness where there is wailing and gnashing of teeth. This is a recurring Matthean uh, way of speaking. The sons of the kingdom are out and uh, people will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob at table. Right. So right. it's it's bringing people in who are not in and those who are in are out. Right. And this is this is repeated. And it's like in Matthew 22, where the king 
throws a banquet for his son's wedding and invites all the people to come and they all make excuses and they kill his son. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. So what's he going to do? He's going to send his army and burn their city. Wow. <laughs> so this is all pretty heavy stuff, right? This is all about the burning of Jerusalem for the killing of Christ. So it's not about the Jews as such. And, and then in Matthew 27, 25 or so, you have the the whole Jewish, the whole Jewish people, the whole Laos, the whole Jewish people saying, Pilate washes his hands of the crucifixion of Jesus. And they say, it's all right. Let his blood be on us and on our children. Mm -hmm. Right? So the whole Jewish people is accepting guilt for the crucifixion of Christ. So it's not. So anyway, that's a long way of answering your question. I think that uh, you're right, that this author is not saying, you know, the Jews have it right. And Jesus is simply, you know, one of the Jews. No, right. he's, he's saying, no, um, you should be following Jewish law. And those few Jews who did come to follow Jesus properly, his disciples, his family, they led the way in creating the Jerusalem church. Uh, now Gentiles can come in, but they should follow Jewish law as well. So I, in a nutshell, I agree with you entirely. I think that this is the kind of thing that Paul's opponents in Galatia and uh, Galatia, Galatians, we're, we're doing. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Okay. We can speed through the rest of this because uh, now you've seen what's happening with Matthew. It's very similar with Luke. So Luke has a long birth narrative. Everybody knows in Jesus' family who he is. There's no mistake. And now his students will become the apostles of the book of Acts. And they don't include Paul. Paul will become a significant figure because this author will try to incorporate him. But he's not one of the 12, right? Jesus, in this story, visits the temple regularly. He attends synagogue without major incident. Yes, there, there are conflicts. But he reads scripture. He observes Moses' law always. He does everything according to the law, as in Matthew. The, jo the Judeans do not oppose him uh, lethally until the end of his life uh, when he goes into Jerusalem. And now it's different because the Pharisees, as I said before, regard him as a teacher. They keep inviting him to dinner. They <laughs> even warn him to flee in chapter 13 uh, from Herod Antipas, who wants to kill him. It's the Pharisees who approach him and say, hey, teacher, this guy wants to kill you. You should, you should leave town. And so he does. He goes down to Jerusalem. So this is a two-volume work, Luke and Acts, and it's much more sophisticated than Mark. And it pu puts the developments that Mark puts in Jesus' lifetime, it pushes them into the book of Acts. It's in Acts when food is declared clean with the uh, Acts chapter 10, you know, Cornelius story. That's when food, when re remember all the food comes down on the blanket and, in the dream. And that's when uh, the heavenly voice declares all food clean. That doesn't happen in Jesus' lifetime. It happens later, right. right? So Jesus himself lives entirely within Judean culture. It's only after the resurrection that uh, this new way is uh, established. So similarly, look at uh, what happens to the announcement here. So he drops it from the title. Uh, he has a history-like proem there. He drops it, drops it. Dro he never has it. He never has the announcement at all. Uh, and he does a similar thing with Matthew. And then John, just for just to complete the story, we're not really focused on John here, but John represents that totally other view, right? Not Jewish Christianity, but Jesus as bringing truth and light from the other world, right? So in this view, Jesus is pre-existent in, uh, he's, he's with God, he is, you know, in heaven, and comes down into the cosmos of darkness uh, to bring light and life and truth from the other world. He camps, the text says, he camps in human flesh uh, for a while while he delivers the truth. He is executed. People think that's the end of him, but they don't understand that, that they didn't really kill him. He, will, he goes back to his father, but he deposits truth uh, through the Holy Spirit 
which is going to remind people of the truth that he taught. So in this scheme, in John's scheme, there's absolutely no room for use for Paul's announcement of, you know, the imminent return of Christ. That's just not happening. So um, we're at the end. Uh, to summarize the second generation, therefore, uh, already in, uh, say, the third generation, they're looking back. So first Clement, writing apparently in the 90s, says, what did Paul write to you at the beginning of the announcement? He still knows the announcement was unique to Paul. In the second generation, however, only Mark makes a program out of the announcement. And he's the first. He's very bold, right? He's, we've seen he's extremely bold. He seizes a Pauline. Let's, he says, I'm going to have the first crack at it. I'm going to give you Paul's interpretation of Jesus here. Matthew and Luke take him over because they want his material, but they either omit or rework his key phrase. Mark is radioactive. Uh, um, so for those who rejected Paul's understanding of Christ, uh, they have to rework it. And so they they kick into action. Matthew removes all this stuff about Ta Evangelion and finesses it where he can't remove it. Luke just drops it altogether. John drops it, ignores it completely. Hebrews, Luke Acts, First Peter, they all don't have this language. If there was a Q source, right, I'm open about that, it omitted it as well. It doesn't have it. It's missing from Coptic Thomas. So people knew that this was distinctively Pauline language. But later on in the third generation, you're going to you're going to find people now trying to meld all these traditions together and even use the word for the written gospels. So Ignatius, I've taken refuge in the Euangelion and in the apostles. Right? So he's doing a fusion kind of thing. Didache, pray like this, just as the Lord commanded in his Euangelion. Now using it for a text, the Matthew. He's you calling. Passed, you passed he's, Barnabas too, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm just actually skipping over for time oh, okay. reasons. But, okay. But uh, here in Didache, for example, you have him call. You, you have him calling the Gospel of Matthew a gospel, a euangelion, right? Which is so. What I'm trying to say is this is a complete change, an evolution from, uh, as, it's, as I say at the top in the heading here. It loses its Pauline flavor, its distinctive, like, um, hard edge. But yes, in, in Barnabas as well, he chose his own apostles who were destined to preach. So he's got the apostles preaching the announcement, which is not at all the situation in the first generation. So what I'm trying to say is in the third generation, it's all becoming mixed up and confused and, and, and fused and melded together. It's all the gospel. It's all the announcement. It's all the apostles. It's all everybody's, you know, on the same team. Uh, but this is not the impression you get from either the first generation or the second generation. The third generation is pretty much seeing the, the family divided and it's trying to tame the fangs of both sides yeah. and find a way to merge yeah, I think so. I think so. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, very quickly then, to conclude this part, uh, Paul saw himself as the apostle uniquely entrusted with this announcement he got from heaven. Namely, Christ died, rose, ascended, will soon return to save those who trust him, and they should be ready. But this generates all kinds of opposition. He considers Jewish law now finished since Christ has came, come to save all humanity. The Jews, whoever, however, see Paul as a renegade from their ancestral laws, so they beat him uh, when they can, when they get hold of him. They cause trouble for him, as you even see in Acts. Um, he is calling on his followers to be detached from the world, to await the new Paulus in heaven. So the Paulist leaders consider him a dangerous fraud, and they beat him up whenever they can. 
Uh, he refers to all these beatings, right, in 2 Corinthians 11. And then uh, this other group sees Jesus as a teacher of wisdom. They don't agree with Paul either. Uh, and uh, this is the diversity of early Christianity. Huh. But this raises the question then, and this is what I want to close with for today. So we've looked at Paul and the first generation as a, as a window into the first generation. We've used Mark today as a kind of a dagger a, a piercing into the second generation to see the diversity of views. And if you, if you can look at this chart now, I've put Matthew over on the side toward Galatians, right? And Philippians and second Corinthians and, uh, and uh, Luke acts is not all that way over. Luke acts is already trying to meld everything together and harmonize as you said, uh, Derek, in the third generation, uh, by having recognizing the role of the apostles and also giving Paul a large kind of berth, a wide berth, but, and, and giving him kind of spotlight in, in Acts, but not as an apostle. So it's, it's a diplomatic effort to kind of integrate him, and, but show him as if he's in close collaboration with the apostles. Uh, and then, so this is what we've done today. That leaves the question, what's going on here at the beginning? Well, this is where I want to end, but I'll pause for a second in case that uh, that sigh that I heard was uh, prelude to a question, Derek. <laughs> oh, I've got plenty for you. We'll, 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 we'll chat, finish up, and I'll... I'll... Okay. Yeah. So here's what I want to suggest to you from all of this. Of course, again, to go back to what I said at the very beginning, I'm not trying to say this is obvious, this is the truth, this is what I believe, none of that. What I'm trying to say is, given this historical analysis, if we try to come up with the simplest explanation at the beginning of what started all of this, right? First of all, I think that it's most likely there was a guy named Jesus uh, who taught something and had some followers because I think, and he had a family, he had brothers and sisters and a mother, at least. I don't know about his father because curiously he's not there in the earliest uh, text. But anyway, he had the normal stuff and he did teach something. And why do I think that over against the mythicist alternative? Not because of belief or a presumption or presupposition or any of that. It's just I think it's the simplest explanation of all that immediate diversity involving his brothers and students. I think it's easiest to explain by analogy with human, you know, uh, we've, uh, I've, I've lost friends. I'm getting old. I've lost friends in the last few years. And sometimes if they're academics, I've seen it happen repeatedly that there's a contest over their legacy immediately. Like people will say, when the person dies, for example, different groups will emerge and say, I was that person's closest friend. I know what they really wanted. And others say, no. Like even you'll have someone say, no, I was married to the person. That's not what they wanted. And then a close student will say, yeah, well, he told me. Like, for example, what to do with the person's library. You know, well, you have debates. Um, and sometimes quite intense debates within a few days of the person's death. Uh, and it's really shocking sometimes to see the fighting over the, that person's legacy. This, this group saying, I know what they thought, I know what they meant. And other people who feel equally close to them for some reason, even if they didn't know them that well, they studied with them, whatever, they say, oh, it can't be. Or I just read books by this person. I'm sure that this is what they really meant. So what I'm trying to say is by analogy with ordinary human experience, the simplest explanation of that great diversity in very human terms that you see in these letters already, for me, the simplest explanation is that's what happened. Jesus died. Uh, people thought that he lived again. He lived on as a spirit. And then you have this contest over his legacy. Paul comes along, and he was one who used to harass these Christ followers, but he had some kind of vision. And he says, now I know what he was about. He's coming again. He's coming back. And the others said, oh, Paul, 
you're you're full of it. You didn't know the man. You didn't spend time with him. We know what he was about. And he was a Jewish teacher. He lived within Jew and so on. And others say, no, look, if you look at his teachings, he was a teacher of wisdom. So that's the first thing. It seems to me that there, there was a Jesus and that his, the best way to explain the conflicts of the first two generations were that there were deep people deeply invested in Jesus uh, who had different impressions of him and what he was really about. I think this is the same with uh, virtually every religious tradition with Buddhism and, and others, uh, you know, the, the contest over the, the truest tradition. So what, what did Jesus, what was Jesus really about? Here's the money, the money uh, line now. Well, there's conflicting evidence because you have Mark and then you have Matthew, you have Luke and apparently drawing on all this sayings material and you get two, at least two quite different impressions of Jesus. One is that he's going around proclaiming the end time reign of God, right? God's reign is about to implode or, or arrive in the, in the world. This is what we might call for convenience, the apocalyptic Jesus. But you also find a bunch of evidence about Jesus in, in John and in the sayings material that points to a different idea. He's not talking about anything changing rapidly at all. And quite the contrary, he's talking about things growing gradually and seeds, using the seed imagery a lot about you know slow development, how things grow steadily and, and not externally. So what do we do with all this? Well, who, if, who can we line up on the, these two sides? Clearly, in my presentation, John the Baptist was an apocalyptic preacher. Clearly, Paul is an apocalyptic teacher. Mark, in the Pauline scheme, is an, an apocalyptic thinker about Jesus. On the other side, John, much of Q, and Luke, Coptic Thomas, Paul's opponents, some of them at least, Apollos, and the people in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians. They are on another side. They, they, they have a different view of Jesus. So how do you put the pieces together? The prevailing view, as you know, Derek, and many viewers will know, the prevailing view in scholarship is that there's a single line here that you can trace. The, 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 the tendency is to move from apoc apocalyptic, and so they would include the Baptist, Jesus, and Paul as apocalyptic preachers toward realized eschatology increasingly. Why? Because the end didn't come. It's a perfectly good reason, right? So they're all going around talking about the end is soon going to happen. It didn't happen. What are you going to do? Logical thing is reinterpret it, re reinterpret the end in internal spiritual terms, right? So it's, mm -hmm. a, it's an internal revelation and a revision and resurrection that takes place. So the prevailing view is this, that there's, all, there's a steady movement from the apocalyptic origins of the Baptist, Jesus, and Paul toward a little bit in Luke, Acts, John, second century Gnosticism especially, right, de-eschatologizing, and then the proto-Catholicism of the church for 2,000 years, right, de-emphasizing any kind of imminent end and getting more and more settled in the world and building up, you know, the church in the world. So that's, I think it's fair to say, that's the prevailing view. I don't know in your interviews, Derek, if you find that to be also the kind of prevailing view. Yeah, most I, of the historicists take that, uh, yeah, the apocalyptic yeah. is earliest yeah. and then work their way out, even though there are some differences on, on scholars that I have. That's the number one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's right. Uh, in the skull, in the research, that's definitely even my own teacher Ed Sanders, a very eminent Pauline scholars, uh, mostly hold to this view. Uh, that that uh, and Jesus scholars as well. Sorry, historical Jesus scholars hold that he was an apocalyptic prophet of some kind. He was looking for the end. So that's the prevailing view. And I would say, maybe <laughs> it could be, but. Right. There's some inconvenient evidence here. What is it? Well, much of Q is early 
and some of Thomas, some of the sayings in the 114 sayings in the Gospel of Thomas show that they are they are not from they're not from the Gospels. They are free of some of the like the parable of the sower. It's a very simple parable in the Gospel of Thomas. No interpretation added to it. Very simple, just like all the other seed parables. And what you find there is like here, if you think about Mark, even Mark, who doesn't like parables, who says they were used not to illustrate the truth, but to throw people off the track, he still says Jesus always spoke in parables. So that's quite interesting because it fits with the evidence of Thomas, the evidence of Q, that Jesus frequently liked to use parables and short, you know, proverbs and sayings like that. So parables explained by analogy, the reign of God is like, and what do they say? Usually, even the parables in Mark, even the parables in Mark are seed parables, right? The reign of God is like a sower. The reign of God is like the seed that grows secretly. And, and before you know it, it's grown up everywhere, but it, do, it doesn't come down in a cataclysm. It's gradual, it gradually grows right mm -hmm. like like these other parables you find in luke right um so we've already seen how mark uses them uh let's skip over the the interpretation of the parable uh, this this is all to say that uh, mark reinterprets the parable in the context of the church preaching the word right the word is paul is another like here is a bunch of references where Paul speaks of the announcement as the word. You remember back in 1 Thessalonians, they've heard the, that the word went out from you. Uh, so he uses the word as another term for the announcement. So, so Mark has already interpreted the parable in Pauline terms in the life of the church. But then you have to say, okay, but that was... There were parables that were before Mark. So even this author knows a contrary tradition that doesn't fit for him. He's got an awkward task. Remember that principle of embarrassment, right? That he's got stuff he has to use, but he has to reinterpret it because it doesn't fit his model. So he uses the parables as if they're throwing people off the track and they have a deeper spiritual meaning that is in the Pauline vein but it's not the obvious meaning of the parable. The, so the parables are inconvenient because their internal logic is not apocalyptic. Their internal logic is the opposite of apocalyptic. So what I would suggest to you is that you have these two conflicting tendencies in the gospels. One is to portray Jesus as an apocalyptic preacher the other is to pre uh, pre present him as saying, no, uh, the reign of God is like seeds that grow gradually and secretly. And they, you know, the, the kingdom, the, 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 the reign of God will come about that way through the sowing of seed, right? As a gradual, when things come to fruition, it, it's, it's not going to- not trying to let go of what, so one of these traditions cannot be let go of maybe the apocalyptic one simultaneously trying to establish it's almost like when uh, I, I recently interviewed a scholar on jeremiah jeremiah is competing with other prophets we bring you up i talk about you almost with every scholar i talk to and by the way um you got a huge pat on the back from dr goodacre in our interview that i've already launched it went really really viral you know really good video uh we mentioned you but jeremiah is arguing with false prophets and thank you ben for that super chat i'm gonna get all your super chats that you guys gave here when we're done um jeremiah is fighting with these false prophets back at home and he's saying plant your seeds establish yourself in in babylon okay you're not going anywhere you know get comfortable the yeah. other guys are saying we're going back to jerusalem right right, right 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 they right they get right. killed by the babylonian kings the, right. or the babylonian empire destroys these guys because they're yeah. over here probably teaching a message yeah. that isn't working out very well with the establishment of babylon but nonetheless yeah. um or or politically speaking with babylon they weren't okay with it 
hint, hint, maybe Jesus. But I just want to say, if there was this, this might also explain why Jesus also doesn't even know the day or hour in these yeah, same yeah, traditions yeah. in the Gospels. Well, you know, it's going to happen one of these days. But, you know, I don't know the day either, okay? So it, there's kind of this two at the same time, maybe. I don't know. But but what I, what I would suggest to you is we know pretty clearly if Mark, if Mark is a Pauline gospel, right? Right. Then we have a motive for this author to take over the real life of Jesus and rework it into the Pauline framework. So he's taking over these parables about the kingdom arriving through gradual spreading of, you know, good treatment of others, uh, being decent to others, all the things Jesus teaches, that's how the reign of God comes about, right? Mark takes over those parables, just a few of them. He doesn't like them very well. His main thing is to have Jesus talk in apocalyptic terms in chapter 13. But he's kind of forced because he knows that Jesus taught in parables all the time. So he includes a few of them, but he reworks them in a Pauline way. So I would suggest we can see there before our eyes, actually, the transformation of the historical Jesus into a Pauline character. That's where we, that's the best and simplest explanation of where the apocalyptic emphasis came from. So what I'm suggesting to you is there was a double movement, Derek. This is, uh, th there's, good, there's good independent evidence in the pre-Markan stuff, in the parables, pre-Mark, and in Q, which is early, and in Thomas, some of which goes back to earlier stuff, there's good independent evidence, and therefore in John, in a different way, that Jesus was about teaching. Uh, so he broke, so here's what I'm suggesting. He broke with John the Baptist because John the Baptist is an apocalyptic preacher and jesus leaves him behind because he, he he's influenced by that the whole rigorous purity thing he's influenced by it but he doesn't so much go with uh waiting for the end to happen his take is different so he starts teaching no the reign of god is within you it's something that will grow as you you know, live and work in the world and you shed light and, and uh, treat others well. And he, you know, specifies all these values about how you should treat, turn the other cheek and all of that and, and a give to the person who has not. If you've got two coats, give them one. And this is how the reign of God comes about. So this is what he's talking about, the seed, planting seeds everywhere, always coming back to this analogy of seeds repeatedly in his parables. That's how the reign of God grows, planting seeds. It's not, a it's not a cataclysmic thing. It's not a Pauline thing. So what I'm suggesting to you is there, there's a double movement. So John the Baptist is apocalyptic. Jesus breaks with him, not in uh, anger or hatred, but because he wants to focus on what can be done here and now. And that's the, the stress of his teaching. But when Paul comes along, in the second gen in the first generation after Jesus has died, Paul is thinking of the new revelation about Jesus' return from heaven. So he goes in an apocalyptic direction, apocalyptic direction. Mark, whoever Mark is, takes this over and says, Yes, I'm gonna write a story about Jesus' life that accommodates him to Paul's way of thinking. But then Matthew and Luke come along and say, no, that's not really what Jesus was about. And they introduce all this new sayings material. And, and Luke, even in Luke 17, goes as far as, as has Jesus say, you'll re remember the passage when the Pharisees are saying, when will the kingdom come? When will the reign of God arrive? And Jesus kind of says, what are you talking about? It's not going to arrive from the heaven. It is within you. Right. There, right. There, it's not you're going to not going to look and say, oh, the reign of God is coming down from the sky. No, the reign of God is within you. And that fits very well with Thomas. That I mean, that very saying is in the Gospel of Thomas. So what I'm but so what I'm suggesting to you is I think it's too simplified to say there was a single line. Right. From 
apocalyptic to realized eschatology and one linear movement. I'm saying it's the evidence, in my view, I think we can see where Mark is not uh, preparatory to realized eschatology. He's already reacting to it. He's already taking over parables and submerging them in the Pauline vision. So there, so that suggests to me that the historical Jesus back at the bottom there was doing this. Yes, talking about the reign of God, but talking about it in this, uh, 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 you know, natural way of its, its gradual emergence. Paul came along and complicated everything by insisting on his vision, getting into conflict with all these other followers of Christ. Then in the second generation, Mark takes over Paul's mantle and tries again and says, this is what Jesus was about. And then you have all the counter reaction again uh, and people drawing on cue and on sayings of Jesus to say, no, it's much richer than that. It's not just waiting for Christ to return. I'm going to stop the presentation there. Okay. Uh, that's what I have to say about the uh, second generation. Okay, that let me switch sides here because all right, there we go. <clears throat> well, there was a lot there, uh, and we have some super chats, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump into those, and then we'll naturally get into some uh, questions as we go. Yeah, so many thoughts come to mind, you know, so many things. I'm sure as we talk, we'll, we'll cover more of this. So, first thing, I don't know if we already covered this one. Uh, do you have any idea why? despite the Pauline influence for and against, there is no mention to Paul in the Gospels? Yeah, I think uh, that's a good question. <laughs> but I think that to mention Paul would destroy the whole uh, narrative. Um, the story is about Jesus, and Paul lives a generation later. So to actually mention Paul, uh, I mean, where where would he fit in the in the, the story has to be set in Jesus' lifetime. So it would rather give the game away if you actually mention Paul by name. Rather, the way to do it is to interpret Jesus' life in a Pauline way, but not by actually mentioning Paul, uh, because Paul doesn't belong in Jesus' lifetime, right? That's, right. That's, that's clear to everybody at the time, that that would, that would be weird. So if you, if you began by saying even, uh, this is a Pauline interpretation. That would be a very postmodern way of doing it, right? This is like, it's not the truth. It's just, you know, Paul's Paul's angle. That's not what this author is trying to say. He's trying to say, this is the truth. This is what Jesus was about. But he's doing it by interpreting Jesus' life in a Pauline way. Interesting. Okay. Scott Duke, thank you for the super chat. This may be a review. Please ask Dr. Mason how reliance on Josephus could have affected the dating of the Gospels and Acts. Ah. Uh -huh. Now we're going to do a show on Acts, of course. <laughs> but... Yeah. So the the question basically is, um, it has two sides to it. I think that was Scott, right? Was it Scott? Uh, Scott Duke. Yep. Yeah. Um, Scott, I think this this there are two questions here. One is about the stuff that Josephus talks about. Right. How does that relate to the dating of the Gospels. So especially the destruction of Jerusalem and all the details he gives about that. So you can date the Gospels in relation to the things he talks about or when he talks about Pontius Pilate being in office or Caiaphas, the high priest, or Annas, the high priest. When those figures are come up, right, or Antipas, Herod Antipas being uh, the Tetrarch at the time when Jesus is executed, since we know those dates, or we have a rough idea of those dates, uh, that these are things Josephus talks about, therefore we can get an idea of when they existed. We can date the Gospels in relation to them somehow. That's one thing. The second part of the question is, what about actual use of Josephus's works? Right? Did the authors of the Gospels use Josephus' works? Not simply did they know the events, that Josephus also talks about, but did they use Josephus' work? And since we know the dates of Josephus' work, the war was completed in the late 70s, the antiquities completed in 93, 94. If the Gospels 
use Josephus as a finished text, not simply refer to the events he refers to, then obviously they're later than his his works. Uh, and uh, to make to make a brief answer to your question, um, I I would I have argued, and I would and will argue, that Luke Acts is easiest to understand uh, on the hypothesis that it its author knew the works of Josephus. But only in the case of Luke Acts is that, I think, clear, because the reason is you have quite striking uh, uh, yeah, not, not just in the, in, the sub, in the events, but in the framing of them, the way they are told in the narrative elements, they seem to be borrowed from Josephus or to reflect Josephus' interests hmm. in a very distinctive way. And if that's the case, this author used Josephus. Uh, I don't, that, there's no evidence of that in the case of Mark or Matthew or John. So, yeah, I don't think you can use Josephus in that way to date those Gospels. But uh, the things he refers to, uh, we can date sometimes, and that helps. Awesome. Well, ladies and gentlemen, too, just if you wouldn't mind, hit the like button. It helps us grow. I appreciate you. There's around 300 people watching, so I really appreciate that. JD Man Six, thank you for the super chat. I appreciate it. He says, "Hey, I just want to say thank you for having such great and amicable, amicable conversations in an age where atheist YouTubers are becoming more angry." So, I would like to comment. Thank you. Uh, I think it's important that when you approach subjects like this, you know, you don't carry a chip on your shoulder, so to speak, because we're like. Me nor Dr. Mason believe uh, we're not Christians. We don't believe in these things. He is a historian. He's approaching these things, trying to best account for the data. And uh, what would be the point of just bashing or going out, being rude, trying to, you know, I think what you did was a great takedown in and of itself on this inerrant, infallible, magical approach, right? So there are Christians I know that are scholars who see what you're saying, accept what you're saying and are still in some sense, traditional Christians. Yeah. Uh, they're far from a fundamentalist evangelical, which is right. kind of the dangerous territory, in my opinion, because I was there. Uh, but I still don't attack. I don't think it's important. I think it's better to just kind of carry yourself in a way that's like, look, I think you guys are mistaken, but nonetheless, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, people were wondering, like, it sounded like you were a believer or they're, they're like, they're in the chat. They just can't understand. Like, and I think that that happens all too often for people on both sides, um, if you think there was a historical Jesus in the way you sounded, they go, oh, you're uh, secretly a Christian in, in in wolf's clothing, but really you're secretly a Christian or something like that. And it's like, no, just because you think there was a guy does not make you, uh, you know, anything like that. So can, can I, I res can I respond to, two, to, to, to that in two ways? Please. First of all, first of all, I mean, we're. I think in some sense, we, we are all, if we're not, uh, or many of us are somehow Christians. When I visited Israel, when I studied in Israel, I was a Christian. Um, it didn't, it had nothing to do with what I believed. It's a category. You come, you're not Jewish and you come from a Christian country. You're a Christian. You don't come from a Jewish state. You don't come from a Muslim state. You come from a Christian country. You celebrate Jewish, uh, Christian holidays. You celebrate Christmas, right? You have you take days off at Christmas and maybe Easter, you're a Christian. It doesn't matter what you believe. So I, I'm not afraid of the term Christian. I've been considered a Christian often. It's, it's, it's not something that worries me. If you mean a believing Christian in the sense of believing the creeds, uh, no. But a cultural, I mean, in some sense, we're all cultural uh, Christians in the sense that this is a Christian. Our, we can't see it when we're inside it but our societies look Christian to the Muslim and Jewish and Eastern East Asian worlds. They look at all of Europe as Christian, even though most Europeans are not believing Christians, right? So right. This, this terminology, uh, I, I don't think we should be afraid of it and it's not a polemical issue. And who is or isn't or what you mean by Christian? I have many friends who would call themselves Christians, but they don't believe. I mean, they may even go to church, but they don't believe any of the, the creeds, right? But they still like, I don't know, they like something culturally. They, they feel a, a cultural affinity 
uh, Christianity has been so important in the West. They like the music, they like, I don't know what, the, the rituals, but they don't believe anything. So, so I would urge, you, urge all of us to sort of be aware of the real breadth, the spectrum of what that term Christian can mean and not be, you know, are you a Christian or not a Christian? It's a kind of meaningless question. You know, Dr. Price is a Christian atheist. I don't know okay. if people want, there a lot of people watching this are, are really good friends of mine and they probably yeah. disagree with many scholars I bring on. And I yeah. try to be the bridge, right? That yeah. stays yeah. the bridge, not yeah. burn. Please don't burn the bridge. Yeah. Keep the bridge there to try and, you know, get a flow of ideas and information. But he's a Christian atheist. Not yeah. because he believes a single thing that uh, miraculous claims or anything like that, right. uh, but traditionally, like you said, he's a traditional Christian in that sense. He doesn't go to yeah. church, but uh, he always said he loved the value of how ecumenical and like uh, it's the it's like a the theatrical experience inside this large cathedral type building with all these symbols and smells and tastes. And yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, it's just that that's it. It's not believing in this thing ontologically. Um, so also, then, uh, Oh, go yeah, ahead. I, I, I'm a British Canadian and I've spent a lot of time in England and you know, there are bishops in the church. I mean, these guys who wear the whole gear that have always been there for at least 50, 60 years. Um, if you ever see a TV show called Yes, Prime Minister, Yes, Minister, they make fun of this all the time, that in the Anglican Church, there have always been many people who just didn't believe any of the Christian, uh, you know, kind of basic teachings. And one, for example, if anybody's interested in looking it up, John A.T. Robinson wrote a book called Honest to God, right, way back in, I think, the 60s, Honest to God, and really challenging basic Christian teachings. The man was a bishop, right, in the Church of England. So this is what I mean by saying, yeah, we, as same as you said about Dr. Price, uh, it's uh, it's a very broad term that has very little meaning. Right. Yeah. Go Absolutely. ahead, Derek, Derek. Yeah. Oh no, you're fine. Uh, someone mentioned the Q source. So if you didn't watch this part of the episode, he isn't putting a lot of weight into this. Okay. He's saying he thinks it's plausible. There is a Q source, but not putting a ton of weight. And for those who I've seen that are friends of mine who would say, ah, you're putting, you're putting Q on a pedestal. These same people love Dr. Price. He is a mythicist. Dr. Price, 100% without a doubt, even more confident than you have ever been about Q says Q existed. Okay. <laughs> now, now I'm not kidding you. Like, I mean, of course it's all, uh, he just says he can't imagine there not being a source there. Now I know Dr. Goodacre says there was no cue and it's not necessary. You can look right. and see a development and Luke's doing his own thing. He's, he's right. extremely intelligent. His vocabulary right. is on another level. His intentions are different, et cetera. But I just wanted to say that to go to bat for you in a sense, because it's like, hold on. Like this isn't a, this isn't like a, why are you using Q in the scholarly world? It's like, it's not a non sequitur. They're not really, this isn't like something to, to be dying on the Hill concerned about. A anyway, I just wanted to say that to say you got Richard Carrier who says Q didn't exist. You have Dr. Bob said, yes, it did. What I mean, like, you know, it's not worth getting mad or. Can I, can I address that quite directly? The, the Q thing. Okay. Here, here's the, here's the situation. And this comes back to what I'm doing here. It's not about advocating anything except history. Uh, that, that by which I mean the method, right? What I'm trying to illustrate is a way of working through this material uh, and, and making a coherent scenario. So when it comes to Q, here's what many people don't understand. They, they think that because it doesn't exist, that's already a strike against it having existed, it's having existed, right? right. So you'll often hear people say, we don't need Q, uh, and and Q. Oh, you you imagine a kind of you know, you want it to be there. Uh, for they, yeah, and it's it. an it's an imaginary friend uh, in some way because it doesn't exist. So you should not believe. So it, what I'm trying to say is, people take that principle of economy, Occam's razor, simplicity, to be a support for the non-existence of Q. That's not quite correct. Um, in because because why do I say that? When you see 
two documents that share a ver that have a verbal relationship, a, a relationship of verbal dependence, there are always three basic possibilities. A borrowed from B, B borrowed from A, or A and B borrowed from C. Those are simply logical possibilities. And you find it many, many times in life, right? That two, two things come from the same, two people quoting the Bible, two people quoting the Quran, whatever. Um, th th that happens. So if that C doesn't exist anymore, if it's been lost, that's not a logical argument against its existence. If you compare A and B and you decide for good reason that A probably didn't use B or B probably didn't use A, the other logical alternative is that they use the common source. So when I'm grading two student essays and I see close verbal relationship between they're using the same sentence structure, some of the same vocabulary, I say, all right, either they, they're friends, they collaborated, they wrote the same thing and changed it a bit, or one's borrowed from the other, the other borrowed from the one, or what turns out actually to be most likely in most cases, is they borrowed from the same source. They went they were, and Googled it. <laughs> yeah, they were looking at the same Wikipedia page or whatever. The fact that I don't know what that source was immediately, I may be able to track it down, but the fact that I don't have it is no argument against its existence. If I can, like if one of these students, if it's an online course and one lives in, you know, in, in Hong Kong and the other one lives in, uh, in uh, Texas, and they don't know each other and there's no reason for them to be in communication, then, uh, and, and if I look at the rest of their text, I may decide it's highly unlikely that one used the other or the other used one or they collaborated. Therefore, it's more likely they use a common source. There's nothing inherently illogical about that. In fact, it's the opposite. It is the purest logic. Um, so there's, the, the Occam's razor does not work against that uh, proposition, if you have discounted as unlikely A or B using the other. Now, what Mark, of course, would say, as you point out, is that he finds it perfectly plausible that Luke, a very intelligent author, used Matthew and, and Mark mm -hmm. in a highly selective, critical, intelligent way, and he simply got rid of everything he didn't like and put in his own stuff. Right. Right, and that's that's a that's a plausible position, but very many scholars, the vast majority of scholars, would say it doesn't work for me. And why doesn't it work for me? Because it means that Luke, when he used Mark, almost slavishly copied him word for word, like those chunks of Mark we saw in Luke. He used them and, and adhered to them very carefully. So we know that with a kind of inferior source, he was very careful to preserve it. But when he came to Matthew, and Matthew has many of the things Luke likes, he has a birth narrative. Luke says, eh, completely wrong. I'm gonna write a completely different one that has to do with the census. Your whole thing is completely wrong. I can't even find any redeeming value in it. The resurrection story. I also want a longer resurrection story than Mark has, but I don't like yours at all. all right. Sayings of Jesus. Ah, I really like the sayings, very important. You have given us five big blocks of sayings. I am going to take them all and splatter them all over in different contexts throughout Luke. Most scholars say, okay, it's possible. Okay, it's possible that he did this, but it's very hard to understand psychologically and just in human terms why someone would treat Mark with such kid gloves and preserve Mark in big chunks without tampering with Mark hardly when he uses Mark. Like Matthew is much more likely to change Mark just to flat out rearrange it. Luke doesn't. He either, he either keeps it or, or uh, drops it. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's less likely to fiddle with Mark. But so what we need to believe is that this author was so careful with Mark, and yet with the author who was most like himself, 
who had much closer interests to his own, he just kind of blew him off and yet took over his sayings material, except even then he, he blew it all up and atomized it. So most scholars think that's just implausible. It's, it's Yeah, and I, I could... I could play devil's advocate and throw out yeah, some ideas, yeah. of course, that would make me think maybe Luke. And, and look, I have no dog in this fight. Yeah, no, neither do I. Yeah. Uh, but I could think of things like like Luke is not pro Torah gospel. Uh, he he he's not. He, I think he sees Matthew, and I'm just being completely hypothesizing here. I think he sees Matthew and says, "Hell no, we're not doing this Torah observant." Gentiles must be circumcised thing. In fact, Matthew says not to the Samaritans, uh, not to the Gentiles throughout the entire message. Then at the end, he goes, oh, now go into the nations. And then like you look in Luke and he's already going to the Samaritans. He's entering the cities. He's So there's something here. I think it's possible. I don't know. I'm not a textual guy. Like I have no dog in the fight, but yeah. it's like if I were to play devil's advocate, I could really think, man, this intelligent guy is trying to rip Matthew a new one. And he's saying, ah, nice try, buddy. We're making yeah. this thing happen this way. I don't know. But we got no. a super chat from Ben. Uh, and and I don't know if you'd like to make a comment, Ben. Thank you again, my friend. He's the super intelligent guy who wants to come and throw us curveballs. You know what I mean? <laughs> I think he was absolutely nonsense, and I've never found that it was an issue in Doctor Dr. Mason's presentations. He's always he always highlights and uh, al the alternative well. So, yeah, the, the, uh, thank you, Ben. I appreciate that because the point is that even if you do hypothesize that. Luke didn't know Matthew, so therefore there's some other thing they have access to. What I was trying to say is I don't know what that is. Right. Uh, it right. could be one well-constructed text. It could be three different texts. It could be who knows. But there's just something else they used. You know. That's actually Mark Goodacre said this. He said uh, a lost gospel called Q. Mm. He doesn't think that's necessary, right? But he still says, I'm not denying Luke doesn't have sources possibly. Or that, I mean, and even like Dr. Uh, McDonald, who does his entire, yeah. you know, uh, the Homerics and these yeah. epics and whatnot. Like he says, no, nah, he thinks there's more than just it's floating in the air in yeah. some cases, even though it's possible. Yeah. But they're using sources, even if it's oral tradition that's in the air at the time. So- so that, that it's just to me, there's something more being used possibly. And uh, look, thank you for the super chat. Dion says, I liked your video. <laughs> look, I try to reserve from saying, please go like the video. Cause I say it because if you don't go watch, uh, there's another guy, a really good friend of mine, Doug from Pine Creek. I mean, he'll have three, 400 people on a live, right? He never says, please like the video. I think his channel would grow so much faster if he did. I know a little bit about algorithms and I know a little bit about social media and maybe uh, this is my, you know, people take jabs at me for this, man, you promote yourself a lot. You bet your ass I do. There's a reason we grow and this information is getting out there is that I'm asking you to just simply press the like button. If you like the content, if you don't like the content, dislike the content. I don't care. I just want to try and make YouTube see us. And so if I see 400 people on and there's 60 likes, I'm going more of you guys could hit that like button, right? That's, that's what I do. So thank you so much for that. And I apologize if I always frequently do that. I don't want that to be a nuisance. It's just, I understand how Facebook and how YouTube and all of these platforms work. They want to see that you like it. They promote it to more people. Simple as that. So anyway, <laughs> Um, here's, here's another reason why we shouldn't be too fussy about the nature of Q, because if you look at both Matthew, but especially Luke, uh, there's a bunch of sayings material in there, right, that is not in anywhere else. So the Good Samaritan, the rich man and Lazarus, things like that. These are only in Luke. So then you have a question. If there was a Q, like scholars tend to say Q is what Matthew and Luke both use. But imagine if there was a, a, a big saying source cue. There's no law that says you all both have, it's like you both have to eat your dinner completely before you get dessert, right? right. You, you, you <laughs> both have to eat the whole thing. Well, why? That wouldn't be a very human uh, thing to do. Normally, some would take some of it and some would take other parts of it. And that could mean that 
some of the stuff that's in Luke and not in Matthew is also from Q. Why not? Right? Or vice versa. So then Q becomes this amorphous, uh, you know, um, uh, kind of, we don't know what it is. Actually, it's a kind of soup of sayings. If it existed. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say about it. No, thank you. And I just want to address one thing. Poker Man, I'm really good friends with Doug. You're right. He doesn't care to promote it. He just does it for fun. And I look, I, I when I talk to Doug, I'm like, bro, why don't you do it more? Because you want more exposure. You want to get, you know, more people aware of like Socratically testing their own faith because he's he takes the sort kind of a mixture of critical thinking with Socratic method and mm -hmm. applies it to Christians and he tries mm -hmm. to get them to examine epistemologically why they believe what they believe. Well, I do this actually, this is my full time job. Mm -hmm. This is how I make a living in order to fully invest into constantly like this is an online uh, college course, technically, from various scholars and some of the people I interview aren't welcome to teach at colleges. They're not like in the academic circles like Dr. Richard Carrier, Dr. Robert Price. They're not allowed in uh, colleges, if you will. They're not They're not welcome to come and teach there. And it's not like they want to. And you even talk about this. You're like, yeah, there's too many politics involved. And I, and I get it. But now we have this medium called the internet. And so this is a way of, of getting this information out there. And uh, I do this for a living. So there's a difference between Pine Creek, he works and does his own job and then does this on the side, which I did that for three years. I did this on the side. I also did my recovery channel on the side. Finally, I got enough eggs in the basket and said, okay, if I drive this home, can this become the gig that I could put all of my energy into? And I want to get every scholar on planet Earth that's worth his uh, grain of salt, if you will, not only to interview them on the channel, but to have them communicate with other scholars you never thought would ever happen. Like, mm. who had ever thought this person was going to talk to this person? Come to Myth Vision Podcast and you'll see a miracle. You know what I mean? Like, that's <laughs> my goal. It's like, what? Hold on. You wouldn't expect that. Yeah. Sorry for taking us off the, the topic there. But um, I guess one of the interesting things, too, if we could comment on John, because that was the one you try to stay away from as much as possible because it's late in the game. This is probably third, fourth generation stuff, right? Um, probably. And it, it depends on if you see there's three layers to John. or diff Some people say there's an earlier form of something here. Very, can I use the term Gnostic-like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's a very old view, by the way. This is Rudolf Bultmann, that there was a, I think uh, an ecclesiastical redactor, a church redactor who editor who, you know, reworked it to make it safe. Uh, yeah. Safe, safe text. Yeah. It's interesting. I don't know yeah. enough, man. These guys are yeah. far brighter than me. Yeah. I just, one of the things that gets me about the apocalyptic thing you talked about, John yeah. 21. Okay. Yeah. This Mark teaching that someone was going to be alive okay when when this was all going to end this apocalyptic yeah. stuff john is so flattening that out it's not even funny it's so realized eschatology but by john 21 peter hears how he's going to die he's not liking it well, what about this guy the beloved yeah. Disciple, yeah. right yeah. i don't yeah. know if this is john i don't know if this is lazarus i don't know if they're the same i don't i don't even care the point is he's a disciple of some yeah. sort yeah, a yeah. beloved disciple yeah and he says look it, what if, if it's my will that he remains till I come, what is that to you? Like, like stay in your business, worry about yourself. You got plenty to worry about. Don't worry about him. And then the, like the author gives you this hint into oral tradition, I think here by saying, mm -hmm. well, the rumor has it that he wasn't going to die. Yeah. But that's not what he said. That's that, that, listen. That's not what yeah, he said. Yeah, he didn't yeah, mean yeah. to say that. Um, he just said, what if it's his will? And obviously it wasn't his will. So yeah. he died. Can, what do you think? Is, am I on the money here or what? I mean, I, uh, like yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, the whole, as you said, the whole, it's such an odd text. So yeah. you get these very clear themes pronounced all the way through and a very clear structure. Like, you know, I, I showed you the structure of Mark. John, in a way, is like Mark on steroids in a certain sense, you know, sure. because it also it has like 21 chapters and the 11th chapter is the middle chapter. What happens in the 11th chapter? Everything changes before the 11th chapter. My hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come after the 11th chapter. My hour has come. My hour, you know, this is yeah. it. This is the time. 
and what is the what is the what is the transition the pivot the raising of lazarus the raising of lazarus occupies an entire chapter chapter 11 and before that time it's like the it's like the last of the signs right and this author is numbering the signs this is the first sign that jesus did this is the second sign that he did and by some counts it's the seventh sign depending how you look at it but then it all fits together neatly right so there's this time when his hour has not yet come where he's doing signs of what of his heavenly radiance right his heavenly glory to show that he came from the other world uh this is how he proved he came from the world of light and life and truth the world of the father he brought this this light and these were signs in order that people might believe right, right. so anyway what i'm saying is uh, you've got these very clear thematic and structural devices and yet at the end it all goes kablooey you know with chapter 21 and the the whole question of who's the the the, the faithful witness and who's the like what voice is the author using there uh who is he claiming to be this is getting confusing and so yeah you have many many theories so i don't know short answer is i don't know but i will tell you this for free that um <laughs> I do think that by far the most likely candidate for the beloved disciple is Lazarus. And the reason that the whole not dying thing comes up is because he was already raised, right? So uh, the, the whole business of uh, being raised to eternal life in John, right, uh, suggests that you're not going to die. And if, and, if, and if Lazarus has already been raised, what's the point of that if he's going to die again um right like he's already been dead he was dead three days in the tomb he was stinking already his corpse was decom days, decomposing well yeah depending on your count the inclusive or exclusive right but it's it's uh he's been dead enough for the de be decomposing right and now <laughs> and he and jesus waits where he is in order for him to die, right? He gets the news that he's near death. So the text says he stayed where he was. Right. right? So that the glory of God could be revealed. So he goes and raises him. Well, I mean, that's a real downer if like uh, a month later he gets sick and dies, right? I mean, what's the point of that? Uh, so it seems to me also because he's called the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, so he is the beloved disciple. That's how he's called at the beginning of chapter 11. So it seems to me by far most likely, and because after that, Lazarus joins the disciples. He's then there at the Last Supper. He's he's part of the, the, the company. Interesting. So, yeah, it does seem to me, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't put money on it, um, but it just right. seems to me most likely, yeah. So I don't know, uh, Derek. I don't know. I don't know all the poss there's so many variables about how that might be redacted uh, a final edition possibly related to mark possibly sanitized with a expectation of the second coming that isn't actually implicit earlier on in the text uh rather it's this idea of a deposit of truth right jesus deposits the truth which will now be brought back after his uh departure by the Holy Spirit, there's no room there for, you know, for 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 a second coming. There's no need for it. Right. But there there are hints uh, throughout. So yes, the idea of uh, uh, a safe uh, uh, editing of the work. I don't know. There's so many variables involved. <laughs> That's technical. JD Man Six, thank you for the super chat and everybody who's super chatted today. I really appreciate you. Uh, helps us obviously keep going here at Myth Vision. Uh, I love your attitude. They said I was struck first by how happy you seem to be here. And that is refreshing. Thank you for your attitude and enthusiasm. Thank you. I appreciate it. I love learning, man. It, it, you know, I say this openly. I went from hardcore fundamentalist evangelical. And for me, Dr. Mason, everyone might get a chuckle out of this, you know, and like think, what the heck? I went full fledged astro theology. Everything was an allegory. Everything was symbol, uh, like really kind of conspiratorial, if you will. Like it was all, it's all hoax. Uh, 
this, there's no real history to any of this. It's all purely like the moon and the cycles of the sun and the moon and the stars. And like, that's purely how I looked at it. And oh, there's nothing here. Uh, and then, you know, you go kind of fundamentalist in that way where it's like, there's yeah. no anything. And I started sweeping away and went, oh, hold on. Looks like there's some, uh, there's some bones, you know, in this. And so I started mm. looking and going, okay, now I'm trying to put, is this, his, is there historical verisimilitude to some of this is a reality to this. Hmm. So now I'm like, okay, I'm trying to balance. And for hmm. me, it, I said it before, it's like a magic show. I really seriously believed I caught myself years ago on Facebook. I recorded a video. I had my phone up and I was like, all right, I'm driving my vehicle. I'll had the phone up. I said, if the Bible said that Jonah swallowed a well, I'd believe it. And I said this and I like meant this. And I thought about it when I saw this cringy video on Facebook. You know how you never want to like – there's memories on Facebook. If you're not familiar with it, they show you every year that day like what you said. <laughs> and I was like, what was I saying? Like, like uh, I could see maybe a giant fish potentially swallowing a man, right? Like, yeah. But if the Bible said that Jonah swallowed a well, I'd believe it. That's hmm. the kind of Christian I was and because the word of God said it and uh, you just kind of believe stuff. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, Mitch, uh, thank you for the super chat, brother. Who does Dr. Mason feel is the most convincing as a Blokian methodological? Am I saying that right? Yeah, well, sure. Blo Blokian. Blokian. Yeah. Okay. Mark, Mark, Mark Bloch. Yeah. Is okay. the reference. Yeah. History from below first generation source. Hope the question makes sense. Um, yeah, it, it makes sense in a certain way. I'm not sure precisely what you mean, but uh, so the history from below is um, the Annales School in France, the school of historians, uh, Lefebvre and uh, and Bloch and others. They um, they were so the, the movement had already begun. So uh, here, here for those still still watching, um, history had often been the history of great men. The history of kings and queens, generals, armies, you know, high politics, decisions, battlefields, stuff like that, institutions. And then uh, towards the end of the 18th century, across the board, there was a greater interest, especially with archaeological finds, in the common person. So people who did not make it into the great texts, there's no description of them. They were not great people. But, you know, what about families? What about... Um, how did people eat? What were their diets like? What was their life expectancy like? What was the educational system like? So these questions were more spread out, you know, for the, the mass because we didn't have evidence of individuals. But you could do this history from below by, by gathering sufficiently good evidence. And Bloch was, uh, was, was an advocate of this, as was, you know, as were these other French, um, French historians. Uh, others too, Germans and English historians, but the French developed this so-called Annales School and a journal for this kind of history from below. Um, and it turned out it turned into social and economic history a lot. So the it, it but it, it wasn't necessarily Marxist, but it was about saying that the, your economic conditions have a lot to say about how you think, right, and 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 what you are capable of doing by the constraints of your economic situation. Uh, your class uh, and so on like if you're a slave you know <laughs> you're not going to be making big decisions that have a huge impact probably unless you know uh slave revolt or something like that so history from below so first generation of christianity i think uh the history from below well what would be some good sources would be like paul's letter to philemon now uh, here you have paul on a careful reading i think is actually trying to get the slave Onesimus for himself. Now, this is not Onesimus's view. We're getting Paul's view, and he's not exactly at the bottom of the pile, but Onesimus is. Onesimus is the poor guy who's being traded around. Uh, and uh, so he's uh, Onesimus has escaped. He's a slave who has escaped, apparently, or something like that. And Paul is uh, trying to get him in a way back to his owner Philemon but also trying to tell Philemon you owe me you owe me I've done a lot for you and he seems to be implying 
uh, I could really use this uh, slave, actually. So that doesn't, it doesn't give us Onesimus' point of view, but it does give us uh, an insight into what's really going on in the, the hard ground of, uh, it's not all theological, right? It's mm -hmm. the, the real social life of early Christians. That's important. Yeah. Um, it's tough yeah. to, we. that's why I go to the scholars. It's tough to find what might be, you know, drama that seems real and not just yeah. theological. And that's what I think yeah. gives it some, something to look at, double check before you just, yeah. some guys I know don't do a careful reading. I'm not going to yeah. name names, but there's people I know. It's all one fairy tale, one mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. Everything is like, it's very strange, but it is not like each book has its own meaning with its own author and its own intention. This is why a critical look at it is important, but they just want to get in the, in a satellite and view the, uh, the forest and just kind of float around earth and never get too close where they start seeing imperfections or problems. And that's yeah, what uh, yeah. I'm, I'm more into the imperfections, but I guess he asked though. Um, first and also, I'll, also first Corinthians, I think is a very good um, window into real life social issues uh in the community there i think it's the best one probably fullest i mean the rest of them are consumed with paul going ballistic about you know the, like in galatians or second corinthians but first corinthians has it goes like in a series of a lot of issues about marriage uh the kind of meat you eat to buy meat from the temple that's already been sacrificed is that a problem do you recognize the gods involved? It's not really theological. It's much more, you know, uh, history from below, um, social history. Thank you so yeah. much for that uh, super chat and answering that question, Dr. Mason. Uh, J.D. Mann says, I grew up in the IDLP and only deconverted a year ago. The IDLP is the Institute of Basic Life Principles, I think. It's a non-denominational uh, church. And uh, I had to look that up, by the way, because I was like, oh, what is the IDLP? <laughs> Well, thanks, man. I appreciate you tuning in to Myth Vision and everybody tuning in. Dr. Mason, before we go, because I'm going to go ahead and let you go. Uh, uh, I know we've had three hours of conversation. What is our next episode to give everybody a tease who's watching now? Well, uh, what we talked about, Derek, at some point, I'm not sure how quickly we can we can do this, uh, was something on uh, Luke Acts. So that would put us into the third generation of be using uh, Luke Acts as a kind of um, uh, uh, measuring stick. But there, the idea, the question would be finally getting around to this issue of Josephus' influence on New Testament writers. Did the author of Luke Acts use the works of Josephus? Mm. Um, so that, that, that might be something to do. Uh, we can talk about that down the road, but uh, I'm not sure how quickly we can do it. Uh, but you know, it takes some takes some work, takes some well, preparation. Well, maybe we do one on Luke, Cliff hang them on Luke, and <laughs> to go into Acts. I mean, because I, yeah. the one thing I appreciate about you, and I want you to know this, and I want everyone watching to know this is where I stand. Um, you're very, very thorough. Even if the audience disagrees, let's say on something that you conclude, right? You're very thorough, and you take your time, and we can tell there isn't. You like have no stake in this game. Like it's like, oh, I could be wrong. Okay, like, like yeah, that's true. <laughs> the best part. I think that people can. You're so gentle in your approach and you're thorough. So, thank you for what you do. Thank you. I ask everybody, please get the books. Go check out his material if you really want to get a deep dive into Dr. Mason's work. Please do. This is free college right now. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. And you do a great job putting these charts together too. That That's one thing I really appreciate. Hey, my pleasure. Really enjoy it. It's a lot of fun to, uh, you know, to talk to people who care. So well, I can't see you all. I can't see your questions uh, the or comments. Probably maybe a good thing in some cases. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. But, uh, you know, when the screen fills, that's, uh, that, that's all I've got. So, uh, yeah. There you go. There's, there's Thank, a you. I, I, Thank you. I, I won't show you anything that'll hurt your feelings, Dr. Mason. Don't <laughs> worry. <laughs> it wouldn't hurt your feelings anyway. You're just so smooth, man, like a duck with water rolling down its back. So 
Thank you so much. Let's do this again. Um, we'll talk about dates here in just a second. And ladies and gentlemen, hit that like button. If you guys really like what we do here at Myth Vision, hundreds of videos. I did a cliffhanger video yesterday on the historical Jesus with Dr. Dennis McDonald and Dr. Price. The other two videos to that series are on Patreon. I've got three or four other videos that I did with Dr. Goodacre. They're on Patreon. They're not released to the public on YouTube. It's a way to help build the channel and to grow it. It's only three bucks a month for the minimum. You can access hundreds of videos with Dr. Bob alone. There's so many. Uh, you guys can help out in that way and become a Patreon member. So thank you so much. And never forget, we are Myth Vision. <laughs>